Sorry about that. It's really loud. Uh, so I'm going to kick off the meeting. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the regular council meeting for Monday, January 9th. And at this point in time, I'd like to acknowledge it with respect that we are meeting on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Kongan speaking people. And we're honored to have the opportunity to build strong working relationships with the people of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. If I can get a motion for approval or a receipt of the near-term and long-term agendas and approval for the agenda for the regular council meeting tonight. Council Ward, second. Okay. And all in favor? Okay, unanimous. So I just, uh, Mayor's message, I just have a couple things that I wanna um, state. First of all, I just wanna have, just say Happy New Year to everyone. And hopefully 2023 will be one filled with happiness and health. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to publicly acknowledge our public works for the uh, work they did on snow removal, and uh, during during the Christmas season, it was phenomenal. And I can compare that with the other municipalities because I had meetings to go to and uh, our roads are certainly a lot better than any other municipality. So well done to Public Works. We, we did a, a little celebration. We bought them some donuts and coffee. So it uh, wasn't much, but that we certainly appreciated it. And uh, the third thing, I just want to let everyone know, I think everyone has probably received their property assessments for 2023. They've received them in the mail. And uh, I, I'd like to point out to people, I know I already received a few emails. People said, well, I read it's a 20% increase. Well, no, your taxes aren't going up 20%. Your property assessments have. And so it's a combination of, of the mill rate and, and your, your property assessment. And your, 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 your taxes basically only go up if they're way above the average for your, your type of home that you have. So please, everyone, you can stop sending the emails. And, you know, it's not going up 20%. So I just, I'd like to point that out. It's in our, uh, it's well explained. Uh, I think, Jen, you must have posted something there in the, uh, on our website. It's well explained there. Do you want to add anything on to that, Jen? Certainly. Uh, so you are correct. We do have commentary on our website um, that we keep up there year round. Just a little bit of um, a, an education piece, if you will. You are correct. You always want to consider how did your property's assessed value change in comparison to the average assessment change? Uh, if anyone has had a look at the agenda that has been published for service review starting tomorrow, um, within that agenda, you will see that right now the draft property tax increase for 2023 is a little over 6%. So we will start talking about that at service review tomorrow. And those discussions and direction from council uh, will continue well into this month, into next month uh, as we continue with budget deliberations. But the assessment increase is in no way indicative of the increase in property taxes for the community. Super, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to get a, a please motion for the adoption of the uh, special council uh, meeting minutes from December 5th and the regular council meeting minutes from December 12th. Do you have a motion? Council Grove, seconder. And all in favor? Unanimous. Okay, public participation. I understand we have one guest uh, so far registered to, to speak. Um, if there's more, then we'll. Okay. So, if I can, uh, if you could just identify uh, yourself and your address. And I just want to point out right now that uh, comments pertaining to the following matters that have been subject to a public he hearing are prohibited at this meeting by law 1930. CD 33, 2350 Sook Road. So if the first gentleman wants to come up. And I understand that, Tim, you wanted an extra two minutes. So I'll need a motion from, from the council 
uh, to extend this by two minutes. So we'll give them a total of four minutes. Councilor Grove, yeah, Councilor Jensen, all in favor? It's unanimous, so you've got four minutes, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, the red button, the button. Perfect. Okay, is that better? Again, Happy New Year, and thank you for the extra minutes. Um, my name is Tim Keoghan, and I live on Hawkery, and I'm, uh, in, I'm in here to speak in favor of the motion that's going to be presented by Vice Councillor Jorgensen today. A few things the city knows about Lagoon Road. 79% of the traffic on Lagoon Road is speed. The RCMP do not have the resources to effectively enforce the speed limit on Lagoon Road. Speeding on Lagoon Road threatens the safety of pedestrians, including children that walk up and down that road, but also cyclists, pets, and wildlife. Noise from speeding on Lagoon Road is an irritation to many of the residents that live near that road. A traffic study in 2018 concluded that speeding on Lagoon Road is excessive and therefore could possibly benefit from speed cushions. That was not the case for Melbourne Drive. Speed cushions were not ever recommended for Melbourne Drive for that purpose. However, today we have speed cushions on Milburn Drive, and they are having a very predictable negative impact on other roads like Lagoon. We now have more speeding on Lagoon, exacerbating an already dangerous situation. Plus we have traffic forcing its way down through roads like Hawkering and Aloha and Anchorage, trying to avoid this, the cushions on, on, on the, uh, Melbourne. They're often speeding down these roads, not usually stopping at the stop signs either. And council, this is one of the reasons why the city decided to not go ahead with speed cushions on Lagoon. They knew it would have an impact on other roads. Councillor Jorgensen's motion simply will allow the city to test these cushions on Lagoon Road. If they don't have the desirable outcome, fine, they will not be permanent, obviously. <clears throat> but you know they're working, at least to some extent, on Milburn Drive to, to control speed. They might have, they might work on Lagoon Road as well. Test them and find out. There's not much to lose. At least it gets the city going in the direction to help mitigate, control some of this speeding, some of this senseless and dangerous speeding that's going on along Lagoon Road every day. And one of the things I wanted to bring up, the speed indicator signs on, on Lagoon Road are measuring, taking data, but please remember that they're taking data at probably the quietest time of the year. And in order to get an accurate, data you're going to have to compare it obviously for the whole year or at least the months months sort of thing i appreciate the extra time and, and uh, thank you thank you very much any other speakers oh carol please miss brown thank you mayor and council uh, carol brown i'm here representing friends of havenwood park this evening Friends of Havenwood Park want to commend the city for the work done to bring forward the draft Havenwood Park management plan this evening. We are pleased to see the vision statement reflects well with the intent of the original 2005 vision statement and the 2008 covenant on the park. It also provides a needed update to address current issues of protection and community use. We look forward to the opportunity to provide feedback in the finalization of the plan. During the last calendar year of 2022, 
Friends of Havenwood have contributed over 500 volunteer hours of community service in Havenwood Park. We worked 48 of the 52 Fridays of the year. We were able to pull 87 cubic meters of invasive plants from this beautiful park. We wish to express our appreciation tonight for the quality of work in the draft Havenwood Park Management Plan put forward by staff for council's approval this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. That's uh, absolutely stunning numbers. I didn't realize that. And uh, so a shout out to you, the Friends of Havenwood Park, phenomenal. Thank you very much for all your hard work on that. Any other, uh, any, uh, anyone else, please? Mr. English. Good evening, uh, Mayor Kobayashi and Council. Um, my name is John English, I'm with the Royal Bay Homer Association. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. But I'm, I'm, I'm uh, here on behalf of our organization tonight, just to let you know that we have had uh, three uh, quite amicable meetings with uh, Seacliff and uh, Renaissance. They were the two developers of the of Colwood's waterfront lands. Uh, uh, we would like to report uh, positive results uh, to you tonight, but unfortunately we can't. Uh, we're here to tell you that these developers are, at, are not going to develop Colwood's waterfront lands into a world-class destination for residents in the region and for visitors to South Island as envisioned in the city's OCP. Uh, John Stobel, the president of Renaissance, advised us that what they're planning to do is they're planning to develop uh, that uh, the commercial area and uh, the public area, uh, similar to um, what you see in Lonsdale Key in North Vancouver. Uh, I used to live there. Uh, <clears throat> Lonsdale Key is not a world-class destination or a significant draw for visitors. The reason is it's too small. And uh, Seacliff and Renaissance will be coming to the city soon to present their parks plan. When they do, uh, our organization would urge the city council and staff to ask uh, these developers how they will develop the, uh, the lands, Colwood's waterfront lands, in accordance with the vision outlined in the OCP. This is our, our chance, the city's chance, to lever the natural beauty of Colwood's waterfront lands for the benefit of everyone who lives here in Colwood, not just 30 second warning. a place to, to see, to go and visit, but also to uh, build a commercial tax base. Thank you very much. Uh, one other quick one, our members are also unhappy about the prospect of six story buildings being built along the chosen road on the uh, ocean side. So uh, just wanted to provide uh, you all with that uh, update. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. English. Any other speakers? Going once, going twice. She's gone. Okay, thank you very much. Just uh, just uh, an add on. There's there's two uh, written submissions uh, that are appended to the. Will be appended to the minutes uh, from that were submitted earlier, just to let everyone know that. Okay, uh, at this point in time, it's item six delegations, and we have Cindy Andrew, uh, the director of community partnerships, the village initiative, TVI. It's over to you, Cindy. Well, I say, oh gosh, hello. Let me just move this in the proper location. Is that okay? Nobody's going deaf? Great. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you so very much for this invitation. I'm so excited. I'm probably going to stutter, maybe miss a few thoughts. But the good news is I've invited, um, in the spirit of building strong partnerships and working together, a colleague of mine who's a fellow steward of the Village Initiative and also executive director of a really important uh, nonprofit agency called Thrive. So I can invite Scott to the podium. He'll just be my moral 
com company here because we're sharing the uh, right side or left side. Um, well, I'm kind of a left girl, so you can see. Um, so thank you for this opportunity, and I see Marcy. Thank you so much for your help. Okay, and because there might be the tendency, I'm going to take the remote. If it's anything like home. Are you seeing those slides or are you guys watching Monday Night Football? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. A good little mindful moment, insert. Technology is a friend until it's not. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Maybe while we're waiting on Marcy to get the slides up, I, I will absolutely acknowledge that for some of you, you've probably heard the term, the village initiative. You certainly are probably very familiar with the African proverb of how it takes, takes a village to, to raise a child. Um, but I really appreciate the invitation to come and share a little bit more information tonight and really just treat this as an extension of an ongoing relationship that we already have in place. So are we ready to rock and roll? Okay, thanks, Marcy. Whoop, here's me, too fast. Thanks. Um, a little bit about the village uh, genesis, if you will, to get us started. Uh, a few years ago, I was invited to, uh, to work with and support uh, associate superintendent of the school district, this notion of healthy schools and promoting the health and well-being of young people. And it didn't take very long to get to a point to say no one system can do all that's needed in order to support the health and well-being and flourishing of young people. And so wisely, the, the district and working with Island Health invited others to the table and said, if you care about the health and well-being of young people in our community, in particular West Shore Soup, thinking district-wide, please join us. Some of you, and I think Cynthia, of conversations we've had over the years, were parts of other tables that often you know, brought similar subgroups together. Um, but this case, invite having the district working with Island Health to invite community to the table, the community came and the community also reminded the district to say, you're not the only ones growing. The demands that we are seeing escalating in our community from Hallwood through to Pachita, Port Renfrew, are, are in particular, the West Shore, of course, and Souk, are increasing just as much. And we need to do things differently. We need so that was the genesis to what is now the village initiative. On your slide, you'll see who sits around this interagency network of about 40 plus organizations. So it's gone from pr the predictable cast of great characters like Boys and Girls Club, now named BGC, and a, a shout out to their executive director who's here with us tonight, another steward of the village, um, to local governments. So we have the CAOs of, the, of your neighboring municipalities, Langford, as well as Souk, who sit at that table. We have a whole bunch of nonprofits, Scott's being a good example of that. Liz Nelson and Pacific Center Family Society is a name that many of you will recognize as another. So that visual there gives you a feel for the village, if you will. And I would be remiss to, to not under, to miss saying again, thank you for Colwood for being part of the village and recognizing that the municipal governments have a very significant role to play in addressing the strategic priorities that our village shares. And we're gonna to get to those shortly. But in essence, I hope you consider the village initiative, it's basically a, a mechanism to fast track to strategic coordinated services to better support the growing needs we have in our community. So, for my usual way that my brain goes, I've already touched on half of this. <laughs> you will notice the, the underscoring of the word we, um, because often people look at this and go, oh, the village initiative, what, you know, what is that? It's its own organization. It's actually all of us. It's the people in the room this evening. It's anyone who cares about the, the health and well-being and vibrancy and prosperity of our community because it's all connected. Um, but why we started and echoed through the last few years was this notion of we have common concerns, we have shared goals. We know you can't have a prosperous community if you don't have a healthy community. What does healthy community looks like when we think about children and youth? It's investments upstream. 
it's looking at, you know, do our kids have enough opportunities for pro-social interactions and a way to build agency and connection in their community, which are fundamentally critical protective factors in our, in our world. We had a lot of silos. Um, and I would say over the last few years, we've seen certainly an increased interest and willingness. And frankly, thank you, COVID, for the one good legacy of COVID is a recognition that we need to work together. We can no longer go back to the way we've done things. And uh, it really, I think, was a catalyst to bringing more people together to work in a more coordinated, collaborative way. Um, and it also looked at deepening the, uh, the cross-sectoral kinds of efforts. So I sort of, I beg forgiveness for, from people like local developers who I connect with to say, I'm actually an educator and a health promoter in my background, but I find I'm talking more about urban planning of late um, because you can't tease them apart. And one of the priorities has absolute direct relationship to what we do with the space we have and the planning decisions we made and the investments that development developers make, et cetera. And honestly, I couldn't say it better than Dallas did on that quote that you, you have in the slides that really speaks to the need to work, work differently together. We also need to respond to the needs and I won't spend any time on, on what you see there, but please know they're well backed up by latest and greatest research. Island Health, we have Dr. Murray Fife, who's a very strong advocate for the village initiative and sits at our leadership table. Um, his team supporting us in terms of the, uh, the, da the data collection and analysis around what are some issues that we really do need to con be concerned about. I also want to underscore that as much as we have absolute reasons to be concerned, and we can't afford to rest on our laurels, most kids are doing just fine. Okay? And I think every once in a while when we live in a world where we like to, you know, have a kind of an alarmist take, a reminder of most kids are doing well, but there's enough indicators to say we've got work to do or we're going to have some significant worries to deal with down the road in an escalating way. And the last bullet in terms of responding to the needs is this notion of the voice of youth. I was delighted to hear the mayor speak earlier of that intent to engage young people to say, help us, advise us, what would be helpful? The Village Initiative has been doing that over the years. And what you see there, you can't read it, but the link was provided in the slides, is a summary of what we heard from young people two years ago that began a conversation that we're now entering into a partnership with the city of Collwood and we and neighboring municipalities around middle years youth and what they would like to see in their community. So I'm going to stop there. Hope that works for you, Scott. Sure. And we'll switch spots. And I'll, we'll hog the remote. Oh, wow. Actually, I'll okay. share. <laughs> Why don't you handle the remote? Because I will not be able to figure that out. All those buttons. Um, thanks for taking the time, folks. And um, as Cindy said, this is a collection of agencies and organizations that are working on behalf of not just Colwood, but the entire region of the West Shore and uh, all the way up to Port Renfrew. Um, we have spent a considerable amount of time as, uh, as leaders giving up our time. Um, the last thing we wanna do on our busy schedules is get together and talk about cooperating because we do compete for funds and we do have our internal challenges of our own organizations to run. But the value of getting together and doing this work will pay off uh, way beyond what we could do as individual agencies. So it is very much worth the time. We bring collectively an incredible amount of wisdom and knowledge around working with children, youth and families. And we, we believe we can do that better together. So through this journey of the last few years of coming together and spending time, considerable amount of time talking about what our challenges are, what our strengths are, we've come up with a number of priorities. So this is a distillation of a lot of work that's gone over the last two years. But we've, uh, as you can see, we've narrowed it down into three distinct priorities. Number one is expanding our community infrastructure and space. So for me, with my agency, and I know with Dallas, with BGC, we're in a desperate need for more space. And as our communities are growing, this is one of the fastest growing regions in Canada, we have an opportunity to think, what does five years down the road look like? What is 10 years down, 20 years down? So we have to predict what that growth is going to look like and what those challenges are going to be. So space is going to be a very important predictor of success. 
we need a place, places that children, youth, and families can go, that they feel safe, that they're going to get the services that they need, and there's going to be great staff there to receive them and work with them, whatever their needs are at the moment. So space is really critical. Um, enhancing community connection and service coordination. So we know that if we have wraparound style services that we can do a better job than if we were just doing what Thrive can do versus what we can do as a collective from mental health services to uh, preventative services like recreation for young people, leadership programs, parenting programs across the spectrum of age, we have the opportunity to think that way as TVI where we wouldn't normally have that as individual agencies. So this is allowing us to get together as a collective and say, how can we enhance the community by planning together? One minute warning. Uh, our third one is increasing the capacity of staff. So we are uh, working on a number of initiatives that uh, will help us to strengthen the skill sets of the staff that we have. Um, yeah, if you could just skip to the, we did want to, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. So three ways that you as a council can consider working with TVI and helping us. One is help us to address the immediate need for space. Uh, two, have representation at the, at the committees that you're forming as a council. Uh, TVI would be happy to uh, be part of those committees particularly some of the ones that have been identified, but I don't think we have enough time to get there, but, um, and then continuing engagement of senior staff. So we've had some great success with uh, Ian and with Jill and to just continue to have that support of uh, senior staff uh, within the city is uh, very important to us. So um, we wanted to have a little bit of time if there's any questions or answers, I'm not sure if we do, but, um, we are here for you. Um, I think we have a QR code on our last slide. Please visit our site. We are happy to come out and talk with you about your own challenges in your own communities and uh, how we might be able to help you. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. That was a great presentation and the time frame that we gave you to do it. I'll just open the, uh, the floor for questions uh, for our delegation. Any questions? Um, I, I just have I have one question, I guess, or, or a couple. Um, the um, when, when you got the feedback from the youth, what age groups did you did you tackle it in, in groups of age groups, or did you just put them all together? How, 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 what was the methodology behind that? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. There's a short answer to that, um, and. I look forward to supporting you further as you work with with youth. Um, in this case, it was focused primarily on middle years. So that sort of 11 to 15 year range. Um, and I think actually it would make sense to to share in more detail that experience as part of informing what the city is doing and, and certainly look forward to TBI helping you in that process if, if it's helpful. Thank you very sense? much. Does yeah, it does make sense. Okay. Council Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not a question as much as a comment. I, um, I certainly follow along with what you do, as, as you well know, and uh, appreciate the work that the Village Initiative is doing. And uh, I know I'm not the only parent at the table here. And uh, that stat really that stands out to me is that 64% of um, you know parents have seen or, or have elevated concern anyway around uh, COVID and, and the long-term impact that we haven't seen yet on, on youth. So, you know, for me, that's um, particularly of interest is how we mitigate that. And I think the the work that you're doing will go a long way towards that. And uh, I certainly was uh, heartened to hear about the um, the interest in serving on, on one or more of the committees that we have. So thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Oops. No. Snooze your nose. Okay, we'll go to item seven. It's just notice of motion. So if I, Councillor Jensen, if I could just uh, have you read your notice of motion. There's no discussion on this. It's just a notice of motion. Oops. Oh, I thought you guys were all finished. 
Sure. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my notice of motion that staff be directed to compile a report on short term rental housing in Colwood that includes the following the number of complaints the city has received related to short term rentals and an estimate of the total number of short term rentals in the community. I won't discuss it. Yeah. Councillor Day. Uh, so I guess uh, I'm just, I, I guess, so I guess my question is for staff, uh, would, the, would you begin working on this prior to the next meeting where we'll discuss it? No. Okay, I see that we won't. So that's fine. I, I can save my questions for the next meeting. Councillor Jordison, did you still have a question? You have to push a button. There you go. I guess my um, my question to Councillor Jansen was just in regards to I, there's there's just costs and there's costs involved in staff um, diverting from their work to compile such reports. So I was just trying to figure out what the intention of your motion was, and I think you may have said that there have been some complaints. Um, actually, it's. I don't think it's for discussion right now, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's not for discussion at this point in time. Yeah, we're just, we're just looking at it. Yeah. So it's, you can be prepared. It's because it is just a notice of motion. That's all it is at yeah. this point in time. Yeah, I'm just, what I'm just saying, there's just no real, um, there's no real information in the motion, but sorry, thanks. No, you're up. Okay, uh, just getting on to new business then. Uh, 8.1, uh, temporary traffic speed cushions. Councillor Jordison, this is your motion. Uh, so um, uh, for many years, residents have uh, voiced concerns about uh, the concern for pedestrians, cyclists, pets, and wildlife. In regards to increased speed at which vehicles are traveling in and around Lagoon Road, Milburn Road. And um, after speed cushions were installed on Milburn Drive, uh, the traffic uh, diverted to Lagoon Road, which was the intended outcome. However, the speed at which vehicles are traveling still remains a concern. So in November, uh, late November, I requested that data collectors be placed on Lagoon Road with the intention of, of not showing the speed at which drivers or vehicles were traveling, but uh, so not to influence the ha their habits and whatnot, but to collect the most accurate data. And data on speed and volume are being collected in both directions along Lagoon Road. And, um, and then I, um, at the December 12th council meeting, I presented a notice of motion to have staff investigate the installation of te temporary traffic speed cushions along Lagoon Road. Um, in lieu of this, um, I, I'm not, I guess I'm, I, I don't have the answers on how to fix this. Um, I, you know, I have done some research and I've learned that, uh, designing roads that feel a bit dangerous for people to drive on actually probably are in fact safer and that if a street feels too safe to drive on and too comfortable, drivers will speed. Um, but I still don't have the answers, and um, I, I feel that we we need to do better than just coming forward with recommendations. And we owe it to the residents to act on something. Um, the staff have spent a considerable amount of time on this issue over many years, yet we're no closer to a solution. And um, the volume in this uh, the the volume of traffic in this area is only continually increasing. Um, and I realize, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I real, I, like I'm concerned for the people that are affected by the speed at which these vehicles are traveling along this road. I'm concerned for the people that feel that they're being treated fairly if they if speed cushions are installed along Lagoon Road. And I'm concerned about emergency vehicles and delaying response time. But I don't think that this is the first time this has ever happened in a city. And I'm sure there's data out there 
and there's information and research that could be done to um, deal with this in an effective manner. Um, so I, and I do have some questions for staff if possible, but um, that's basically, I'm just at this stage where maybe we, if we could consider putting the temporary speed cushions down to see what happens, unless staff have some other better ideas, or if tonight, I don't know if uh, John is uh, bringing forward the information that's being collected or, yeah. Thank you. Your Worship, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Should this motion pass this evening, staff will begin the process of gathering the information needed and return to chambers with that information. Exactly. Staff have, uh, as uh, Councillor Jorkinson has indicated, our speed readers have been moved uh, to Lagoon in advance of this, as staff were aware that this, that this was coming. But the primary research on uh, the approach of installing speed cushions or other uh, speed mitigating devices for Lagoon Road as a result of this motion has not yet begun. It would only begin with council direction, which this motion may achieve. Gotcha. So uh, before I open it up for discussion, can I get a seconder and then I'll, I'll open it up for discussion? Uh, Councilor Grove. Hey, I'll uh, open it for discussion right now. Uh, Councilor Day. Thank you. So um, as well as the, <clears throat> pardon me, as well as the reports that were included on the agenda from 2017 and 2021, uh, there were several reports prior to this, um, including uh, the one that created our policy um, uh, that, that initiated the, um, the speed cushions uh, on uh, Milburn as well. So, it isn't the first time that we've looked at this issue, but it is very site specific in, in finding the best solution because the grades and the location of driveways, other road infrastructure all affect how well or how not well uh, our solutions may work. Uh, so it really um, is dependent. And previously, we had tried, um, you know, well, what does the public want? And it, it kind of came out pretty 50-50. Uh, because if you're in the car hurrying to get to a very important appointment, you may feel that between 50 and 60 kilometers per hour is appropriate for you on this one particular day. Uh, if you're walking on the side of the road trying to take your kids to school, you may have a completely different opinion. So I don't think just public opinion um, can, can satisfy everything, but at the same time, we have to put the safety of our streets foremost in, in our planning. And in fact, um, this type of issue, uh, not the same road, not the same neighborhood, is what drew me to City Hall in the first place. Um, because I was walking my kids to school and I was run off the road, <laughs> like off the shoulder of the road. Um, and uh, it's, it's very important that we provide the leadership at this table to try to find the best possible solution. And there may not be a perfect solution, um, but, but we have to keep working to try to get to the best possible solution. So I'm in uh, complete support of trying speed cushions in this location where, where they seem most appropriate when you consider the grades, the other roadways, et cetera. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Day. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I spent considerable time on the 2018 uh, May 2018 traffic uh, safety report uh, that was compiled for calming measures in the Lagoon neighborhood, and a couple things stood out to me. 
Um, one was obviously the, the speed issue. It identified that Lagoon Road meets the excessive speed criteria of the traffic calming policy. Um, but what I found most interesting, and, and in that report and others, is kind of what's acknowledged or known to anyone who, who commutes through Colwood, that, you know, as a collector road, it is a, a commuter route or, or a shortcut for many people. And many folks um, take a variety of routes through there. They'll turn right off the Chosen onto Hatley and down through uh, the neighborhood there onto Milburn. So, you know, in the calming measures that identified the challenges with some of the um, proposed solutions in that if you put speed cushions on Lagoon, you push them onto Milburn as, as was tried to be rectified by the last council, um, or you alternatively push them onto Hatley and so forth. But one thing that I noticed is that despite noting that um, standard commute times were a core issue, there was little sort of time um, time focused measures focused on everything was finite. If we're going to close access to a road or a no left turn or a no right turn, it simply mentioned we're going to close it permanently. You know, if it was no right on Milburn, it was no right on Milburn. And I wonder if um, we could look at uh, the consideration of, um, you know, of looking four and a half years later since this report was there and the increase in population along the Chosen and in Royal Bay and others, that volume of traffic that's going there to look at measures such as um, a commute sensitive closure. So no right turn on Hatley between 6.30 a.m. to um, you know, 8 a.m., for example, no right turn on Milburn during the same time. And then coming back um, at the, the end of the day commute, uh, no left turn off Hatley, for example, so that there is no incentive for a driver to, to avoid Lagoon, go up through Milburn and onto Hatley. Um, and then if you're putting those speed cushions on Lagoon Road, you're, you're, accomplish you're, you're accomplishing both goals. You're, you're slowing the, uh, the traffic ideally down Lagoon um, and then having some time sensitive measures on the other areas. But, uh, you know, I know I'm a little long winded here, but I think um, if you're going to look at a short term measure and I see the, the speed cushions as a short term measure, I think you need to address what's going to happen on those side streets. Um, and then I think then we need to look at a longer term measure. There's there's obviously suggestions there, such as roundabouts and things like that. I think ultimately that's where we'll be successful uh, and dealing with Ocean Boulevard, but that's a matter for another day. So I would be prepared to um, to amend the motion to include some the investigation of some time sensitive signage and road closures on Hatley and Milburn, but uh, I'll hold on that for the moment. That could be included as part of your direction, um, Mr. Earl, it is, it's, could that be part of your investigation? Do we need to have an amending motion for this? Administration will treat a, a positive outcome of this resolution as direction to investigate uh, a speed mitigation on, on Lagoon, which would include um, both of the items mentioned. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Councillor Jensen. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, this is a great discussion, and I'm uh, I find myself uh, conflicted uh, in in a couple of different ways. Um, this there's a lot of work that's been done in this area by previous councils a ton, and I think we saw by the size of some of the attachments. Uh, this has been a focal point for our community for years, probably as long as Cynthia has been around. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that negatively. <laughs> As long as, <laughs> as long as she's been on council, uh, but uh, so it feels like something needs to be done. Uh, the question for me becomes the what, and uh, this is very specific, and it talks about uh, speed cushion. So uh, I was plotting some kind of amending motion, but uh, it. Uh, I think it's acceptable that uh, staff are going to 360 this and look at uh, a variety of options. So I'm, I'm comforted by that. Uh, this is a collector road and the whole idea in our transportation mas master plan is a collector road carries vehicles through to the main through fares. And uh, it's, I mean, there's some, I think there's some disasters across the region of, shall we say, traffic calming um, off the top of my head, the island of highway going to work in the morning at the shipyard. It's unbelievably, it's, it's more like traffic idling, not traffic calming. So I, and, and I think the proof in this pudding is the fact that uh, us doing something on Milburn has now had an impact on Lagoon. And traffic is like water. It will go the easiest or the least 
the, the, the root with the least resistance. And this is a, an exact byproduct of us. Uh, you know, if we don't pay attention, we can cause disruption on other side streets or in other neighborhoods. Now, this particular instance, there really isn't a lot of other neighborhoods. It's the one neighborhood. So I think that we do have some latitude, but uh, um, so other solutions. Now, I looked at the uh, trans, uh, the appendix to the transportation master plan, uh, page 28, 29. I think uh, it was shared uh, to all of us by way of staff there. And it very clearly specifies uh, a suite of improvements for that switch, that, that, that stretch of roadway, traffic calming features, including sidewalk, pocket parking bays, buffered bike lanes. Uh, there's even um, a pedestrian crossing there with some lighting, uh, some light activation at the top of the hill. I'm, I'm not sure if that's there at Heather Bell or not, but uh, I believe at the, at the very cornerstone of all of this safety is uh, the construction of, uh, the pending construction of the sidewalks that are coming. Um, that will create obviously a raised, uh, you know, bit of some concrete for people to walk on, uh, presumably in some somewhat more safer uh, conditions, uh, and also a marked out uh, um, uh, bike lane. But uh, for me, uh, these things, uh, these uh, speed mats and speed humps or road bumps or whatever you want to call them, are not a panacea. And uh, I would like to see uh, other solutions come forward as well uh, for, for instance like um, you know in Europe they do a lot of road constriction construction so uh, it would be a constricted roadway with bollards and and sidewalk approaches and and that's how they would do a pedestrian crossing so it's almost like a visual pinch point uh, and as the road narrows uh, as there's parked cars and the road appears to be narrowing whether it is or it isn't that tends to uh, slow people down as well. So a suite of options for that roadway. Um, putting in a speed bump, because presumably if the speed hump works, then we'd be looking at uh, putting in some speed bumps. And uh, I have some concerns about uh, the unintended consequences for that one person an hour who is gonna still do 100 kilometers an hour and what that means for uh, them losing control. I don't think uh, there's any sort of design that we could implement that would, uh, you know, protect people in, 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 in that case. I think we saw the evidence of the um, vehicle going into the ditch on Milburn at a high rate of speed. So I, I think this is like nailing jello to the wall. Uh, I, I'm heartened by the fact that uh, this, we'll look at this, we'll try it, we'll see what the results are and report back. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Uh, I am uh, going to support this temporary motion um, at this point in time, but I do await a lot of feedback and analysis and data for our work to see what impact it's had, you know, back on Milburn or some of the uh, side streets, Hawkering, Aloha, what have you. Uh, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chair. Thanks so much. Uh, Councillor George, I'm going to let uh, uh, Councillor Grove go first because he hasn't spoken yet, and then I'll get back to you. Mayor, and uh, I'd like to just. Um... Uh, I'm confident that a report from staff is going to move this forward. It would be very interesting. So I'm looking forward to discussing some of these things I have then. The speed questions haven't been tried yet. So I think we should. I think we remember to perhaps make sure we go into the summer season long enough to get some of that busy period covered. Also, the incident that I would like to speak about has happened more than once, but the main one was the junior kindergarten nature class, I believe it was, walking up the east side of Macho, uh, uh, Lagoon at the point where the trees are all there before gold, uh, uphill from Goldfinch. My wife and I walking down the same side realized there wasn't room, so we crossed over. At the same time, a car came around, the car was coming up the hill. And just as everything was converging and we both walked to the edge of the ditch and stopped to watch, we all converged at that moment. I looked up the hill just as the two cyclists came whipping around the corner at high speed. Everybody's great brakes started squealing on the bikes, the cars slowed down, and we all kind of almost came to a stop. But it was just this random incidental occurrence that scares the hell out of me. If people hadn't been aware or awake, or if someone was speeding or on their phone, there could have been some serious incident. There's no room to escape 
on the east side where that slope is very steep and parts of it leads into bramble or at the best trees that might stop your tumble down the side of the hill. So it's actually a dangerous side of the street to walk on. Sometimes there's road signs in the middle of that. So there's two of you, you have to kind of go single file. When the cars converge, this happens now all the time. There's no room uh, for the two cars and for yourself on that side where the asphalt is. I'm looking forward to that sidewalk and I'll think I will help a lot. In the meanwhile, let's gather some information. Let's see these speed humps. Surely they're gonna slow some people down. It'll piss everybody off, but at least it should slow things down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jordison. Um, I just wanted to follow up um, and say that, you know, I, I realize there are similar concerns on Carindale um, and Fulton Road and, and we can't, we simply can't install speed cushions on all collector roads with high rates of speed. But the concern I have is the pending uh, pedestrian access points that are noted in the uh, master transportation plan on Lagoon Road. And if we don't address the speeding or, or try to get a, a handle on it, um, those pedestrian crossings aren't gonna be beneficial to anyone. Um, but I also do think that a lot of this issue may have may have something to do with Michelson Road, and I think that we need to address the traffic volume and flow on Michelson Road um, to to get ahead of this issue as well. We can't be directing all of our traffic down Latoria Road to Veterans Memorial Parkway and have one access route. It doesn't make sense, and it that. Matilson Road needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can get traffic moving quicker along Matilson Road, uh, people wouldn't be vying for uh, shortcuts as much. So, thank you. Um, I'm just going to wrap this up. Then, oh, well, Councilor Ward, I'll let you have your second term. Stealing your thunder there, uh, Mr. Mayor. No, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, commend Councillor Jordison for bringing this forward. It's, um, you know, it's contentious and there's obviously going to be two schools of thought on it. But um, I wanted to just add what you said at, at, at or support what you said at the end that, um, you know, the master transportation plan that we reference may or may not be the master transportation plan of the future. I certainly don't feel that... Um, the, the word I heard we used once was forcing traffic up Latoria to veterans. And when you force something to go against the grain, you're pushing a boulder uphill. Uh, Councillor Jansen, you said it when you said people will take the path of least resistance. And certainly as someone who lives in Royal Bay, for me, that's my chosen road. Uh, hence, that's why I referenced the no right turn on Hatley and other measures to keep traffic flowing on, uh, on my chosen, which ultimately may need to see an additional lane. Um, so there's egress into to side streets and things like that. So you know, let's not um, feel that our hands are tied by a, a plan that, you know, could change in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you still saw my thunder here. It's, uh, you know, it, it, there's an old saying, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm supportive of this motion. I was just more concerned about uh, once we put the uh, speed cushions on Lagoon, I, I, we should also be still tracking um, um, Milburn, because I don't know what's going to happen there, and and I do think the the, the better cure is addressing Machosan Road myself personally. I've always felt that way. Um, it's not only that, I, I guess I have uh, I live off of Latori, and I I don't want any more traffic down Latori. No, I'm just kidding you. I, I know there is a plan here, but uh, I just don't think uh, people will do what's most convenient, and and that's the bottom line. It's uh, interesting that uh, you know you can get you can get sidetracked very easily on this issue, because I noticed on uh, on Saturday and then I went back on Sunday, and I observed Melbourne Road because I wanted to see this because I was out with coffee with one of the citizens here on Saturday, and we were following a truck up Melbourne, and uh, we got to the the uh, the speed cushion on Melbourne. Uh, that was not, it wasn't the last one, it was this, the one in the middle, and the guy went around it, he went on the shoulder, like he avoided it, and I just sat there and I couldn't believe that, but the other thing that I did notice too, and, and it's a perception, because I don't have a, a, a you know, a, a, a speedometer in my head, but I, I noticed that also with those uh, speed, uh, uh, speed cushions, that 
it, it's perceived. I don't know if they're doing more than 40 there, but every time they hop over the hump, then they speed up like they're trying to they're trying to make up time and they speed up to the next hump and then they slow down and go over that one. So, but you know, I'm uh, I'm all for this uh, because we can't just continue to do nothing because you know that's my definition definition of insanity doing things the same way you always done it and expect different results. So I mean I live by that philosophy. So I'm uh, willing to give this a try. You know I, I think it's a good idea at this point in time. And, uh, but just, I, I think that both streets still have to be monitored. Anyways, that aside, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, 8.2. Uh, Draft Park Management Plans, Havenwood and Latory Creek Park. Jill Collins in our senior planner. Over to you, Jill, you've got the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm back. And since last summer, the city has been working through park management planning processes for Havenwood and Latoria Creek Park. So phase one, focused on analysis and early input. Phase two, looked at draft directions and development. And now we're in phase three which includes draft plan review, consultation, and refinement. So tonight, we're going to introduce you to the draft Haywood Park Management Plan and the draft Latoria Creek Park Management Plan. We're seeking your initial comment and looking for direction to release these draft plans to the stakeholders and to comments from the community. So Lanark Consultants has been supporting us through this process. You'll see Kate above me on the screen here. So she's going to walk you through a presentation here for the next few minutes. So I will turn it over to Kate and then we'll both be available for questions at the end. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Jill. I'll just share my screen and presentation here now. All right, is everything on screen and, and fine and visible? We're good, Kate, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mayor, for confirming. Uh, so good evening, and I'm delighted to be here joining the current council to share an update on the ha Havenwood and Latoria Creek Park management plans. As Jill mentioned, um, I will be doing my best to be brief, um, and I'll be going through uh, starting out with the project process review, and then I will review the draft plans, just touch on the overview, and, and really try and focus in on highlights. Um, we're summarizing a couple of long documents, as you can see in the agenda, and so I'll be sticking to the kind of most salient points and leaving questions uh, for anything else that we've missed in between. I'll conclude touching back on next steps and key dates from here. So both park plans um, are being carried out concurrently under the same three-phase process. Um, for the returning uh, mayor and councillors, it's a familiar one. It follows the same format as the previous park plans that have been completed over the last couple of years. And we're currently in the third and final stages of both the Havenwood and Latoria Creek Park management plans. And so we're in that orange area uh, presenting the draft to council. And the next steps will be looking towards doing a public and stakeholder referral in order to refine and ultimately finalize the plans, um, aiming for that to be concluded by the end of March. As a brief review, um, highlights from engagement from May to present include a park tour at each park that was an open invitation to the community. There was a stakeholder workshop, as well as three community pop-up events that occurred through July through August, um, and then a highlight um, for being able to be um, more accountable or finite in our feedback, there were questionnaires for each of the parks um, that were gathered, um, and there are about 80 participants with each of those. In a nutshell, the park management plans being created in this process are planning documents that are long term, so they're planning for the next 10 years and beyond. They're high level, meaning that they are not um, detailed construction. Um, there will be next steps that will lead on before things are implemented. They're living documents, meaning they should be reviewed and updated as needed and as change and opportunities arise in the community. And perhaps most importantly, they're focused on actions for implementation. And this is largely in support of budget and next steps for council and community consideration. Each of the plans, um, was formed through a variety of factors, including site analysis and background documents, et cetera. And I just wanted to note briefly here that 
since both of the parks in this process are well established in the community, there's existing documents from each of them, quite a, a good list as you can see here on screen for each, and highlights for Haywood would included the 2005 uh, Park Management Plan and the Parks Conservation Covenant, which was formalized in 2008. There's also a, a list of other documents which all reference this park since it's so central. And similarly for Latoria Creek Park, um, it's another one of the the primary and largest um, parkland pieces for the city and the Latoria South Parks Plan and Sub Area Plan from 2020 and 2022 respectively provided key recent input and information to the draft plan. Um, so the, the intention of both of these drafts is that it carries forward um, the most important intentions from previous planning efforts and things that have been left unaddressed. Much has been achieved, but there's still more to come. So first, I'll share an overview and highlights from the draft for the Havenwood Park Management Plan. So the illustration here um, is a visual summary of the draft plan's proposed actions. And this covers key items from the plan, including natural areas, uh, the park trails, park access, signage and wayfinding, and furnishing and amenities. As a large nature park, there are several important recommendations and actions for this plan um, that are focused on conservation or management, things that are less tangible. And so these items are not best communicated by the illustration here, but captured in the reports, recommendations and actions that are in, in table format. So the draft plan proposes um, 17 recommendations for Havenwood Park, and they're summarized here in list form. The recommendations themselves are organized under four subheadings, with the first three being more physical changes and the last category being ones that are um, they're more focused on management um, considerations for the park. So access and circulation, natural areas, park amenities, and then finally park management. In the interest of time, I'm going to touch on three of the most important um, recommendations that we've identified for Havenwood Park that are most um, specific to this unique park in the city of Colwood. So firstly, the recommendation to improve the park trail network. Havenwood is well loved um, by the neighborhood and, and the community at Broad and as a nature park with a variety of trails, it offers walking, running, hiking, dog walking, um, and is really a staple um, in the neighborhood and community. Feedback through the process confirmed for us concerns for managing increased trail use and preventing unsanctioned trail development. And all trails aside from the primary trails, which are shown here in red, are currently informal nature trails and are not currently designated by the city. So the intention in carrying forward is for trails to remain the cornerstone of recreation in Havenwood Park. And the recommendation outlines several improvements and actions to provide a successful network in the future. As a first example, the plan proposes boardwalk or footbridges in the riparian area along Latoria Creek, just west of the primary entrance off of Veterans Memorial. This area floods seasonally, and um, the longtime stewards, uh, friends of Havenwood Park, of which Carol did a really <laughs> nice and formal introductory, um, they've identified this area really as a key for park trail improvement, um, recognizing that in in Weather where there isn't a lot of water, you can navigate this area safely and in other times it requires further impact to the natural area and more inconvenience for trail users. So it's a little bit difficult to see on screen, but it's the area that is a black um, dashed line overlaid on the yellow trail that's through the blue area there. So the draft plan also recommends decommissioning select existing trails that are part of the informal network that exists in the park. And this is to better align and support the terms of the existing covenant, um, which is to protect the sensitive habitats and ecosystems alongside recreation. And so the areas for decommissioning are um, the dash yellow line shown on the plan. And they're really areas that um, are either within key riparian sensitive areas or access sensitive bedrock areas, which are a priority for conservation. The solid yellow lines on the plans are existing informal trails that are proposed to be incorporated into the formal trail network and it's recognized that these are well used um, and well loved and to be formally incorporated in both the trail maps and wayfinding and other parts of the park will enable them to both better serve users and um, al alongside um, recognizing the needs of habitat and areas adjacent to it. 
The draft plan also recommends select new trails in Havenwood Park, and these are really in quite specific locations with the intention of better connecting with the surrounding community and, and providing connections between that modified um, network that wasn't previously part of the formal trail network. So the areas that are proposed as new and, and not existing are the green. It's a bright green color shown throughout the image. I'll move along to the second highlight, which is recommendation four from the plan, and that's to protect bedrock, outcrop, and meadow areas. These areas are colored in beige, um, and they're located often at high points in the park. They're highly sensitive ecosystems that are characterized by shallow soils and a diverse blanket of um, grasses, mosses, and wildflowers, and select tree species. And these areas have been identified in biological reviews and in the park um, as they can, under, they can withstand very little human impact or um, impact by park users of various kinds. So the draft plan proposes to maintain access to the primary scenic lookout, which is the highest point or perhaps the, the best known lookout area in the park for many, and also to provide designated access in this area. So limiting access to other bedrock outcrops within the park. The plan proposes implementing interpretive information around the sensitive areas, as well as visual and physical cues to help encourage people to stay really within the designated zone and limit or mitigate the impacts more broadly to the adjacent environment. As the last highlight for Havenwood, I'm going to touch in on the designate on-leash areas for the park. So dogs in nature parks are a divided and challenging topic, and this challenge is not unique to Havenwood or to Col Colwood. Um, dog walking is one of the most popular uses of the park, undeniably, and there are the users that come at all times of day and all seasons, and they're, in a lot of cases, very valuable stewards for the park. Several participants express concern about safety or comfort for the environment or for themselves with encounters with dogs off leash. Others shared how much they value being able to have their dog off leash in the park. We also know that park visitation, including dogs, is anticipated to increase in Havenwood as the city grows. Another key consideration for us in, in kind of putting all the pieces together to come up with the recommendation here is that we asked um, participants about it in the last round and 70% of participants supported designating on-leash areas in the park. And it's important to know that this support was both by dog users uh, or dog walkers, I should say, pardon me, and by non-dog walkers. So dogs off-leash in the park was identified by respondents as the second highest limitation coupled with that support for designating areas to be on-leash. So the role of the management plan is really to balance the needs of the overall uh, park for the long term. And with this, the draft recommendation put forward is to designate specific areas in Havenwood Park as on-leash only. And this is in order to support the long-term conservation of sensitive natural features and the comfort for par all park users of ages and all abilities. So the proposed on-leash areas are the primary trails, which are shown in red on the plan, as well as the bedrock outcrop meadows. That's related to the recommendation previous, which are shown in beige, as well as the riparian areas and wetland area to the north and the, um, the area for park expansion that's been identified through recent adjacent development or pending development, I should say. So moving along, I will share a similar overview for Latoria Creek Park and the draft management plan. Here's the illustrated summary of, of this plan and the proposed actions. You'll note a lot of similarities in the categories or the structure, and that was done intentionally since these are both large nature parks and, and by characterization or by that classification, they have similar opportunities as well as limitations in terms of development or considerations for, for recreation in the park. A key focus of this plan is for connecting to Royal Bay Latoria South development lands to the east. And the areas in green that you can see on the plan here are the park expansion areas and connections that are outlined in the Latoria South plan document. So similarly, um, there are 17 recommendations. Um, some of them have very similar titling, although they, they address the specific conditions of Latoria Creek Park. And they're organized under the same um, general four categories of organization. I'll touch in on three of which there are a couple that are similar and, um, and then we can move along to next steps.
So to start um, improving the trail network for Latoria, similar to Havenwood, trails really are the recreation cornerstone of Latoria Creek Park. We heard very similar concerns from participation for this park regarding increased trail use or preventing unsanctioned trails from developing. Um, and Latoria Creek Park is currently a primary trail along the creek with a couple of connecting points. Um, so it's more of a singular route and less of a network as it exists today. The draft recommendation outlines changes um, to improve the trail network for the future to better connect it and provide options for different levels of, of accessibility and loop trails. A key consideration here is topography. Um, at certain points that requires bridges and stairs and so it limits universal accessibility through that entire primary trail route. Shown in purple, there are proposed improvements to the existing entries along um, the west side and north and south sides, as well as um, four additional trail connection points on the east side related to the proposed development that is currently underway. The proposed new trail connections are shown in green and they're focused in the south part of the park. This is largely um, due to topography and just the orientation of where the creek alignment is within the park space. There's limited area of suitable geography or um, that is avoiding steep slopes and outside of the riparian area in the northern portion of the park. And there's a little bit more opportunity for that in the south side. So that's why um, the couple of proposed new trail connections are focused in this area. The segments that are outlined in white, so there's the trails themselves and then there's a white outline beyond that, are the focuses proposed for looking at accessible trail loops or development um, routes in the park. As mentioned, there are some limitations to having it, all of the components to this park be universally accessible, but there are some opportunities to having select portions of the trails um, be more accessible to those with a range of mobility. Finally, there is a new proposed footbridge at the very southern end um, proposed to connect to the future planned um, Latoria South neighborhood via the old Minchosen Road. And this could form part of um, a small loop that could be also accessible at the south end of the park. The second highlight recommendation is number eight in the plan and it's to support park stewardship and programs. There are existing partnerships with neighborhood stewards and school groups um, and this provides mutual benefit to the park and community and really the long term continued success and health of the park we feel would be improved by growing and formalizing some of these stewardship opportunities. So the draft recommendation here is to continue collaboration with neighbors alongside forming a stewardship group uh, for Latoria Creek Park. And this is really drawing on the success and experience of the Friends of Havenwood Park Group, which was formed um, out of a recommendation that was a genesis with the original park plan and conservation covenant for Havenwood Park. Um, supporting and strengthening ongoing stewardship partnerships with local First Nations, School District 62, and other organizations is also included within this recommendation. Alongside Quite importantly, establishing budget and continuing to pursue funding um, in partnership with supporting these groups. As Carol mentioned, some of the achievements and, and hours that have been dedicated, for instance, in Haywoodwood Park, bring really significant value in the city's role in supporting those groups, supporting them to formalize and identifying and doing what the city can in budgeting to support those efforts goes a long way. The last highlight recommendation here is a familiar one. Um, it's designating dogs on leash. And the reason that I'm kind of repeating this one uh, again is that it is also um, probably one of the more divided topics for this park. Um, a lot of the topics we asked the public about for both of these nature parks, there was a lot of consensus and support on, um, and this one being maybe an outlier. Um, although as mentioned, this being a challenge or sometimes a divided topic is not specific to Latoria or to Colwood, and so we were looking for, for ways forward. So key considerations for us um, for forming a recommendation for Latoria Creek were that 38% of participants indicated they walk their dog, while twice as many participants um, indicated that, that they would support designating off-leash for the park. And so this includes both dog walkers and non-dog walkers that, um, that we heard from in the data that supported um, dogs on leash as a change for the park. And similar, um, it was identified in this case as the top limitation to existing park use, dogs currently being off-leash in the park.
So the draft recommendation being put forward is to designate Latoya Creek Park as an on-leash park. And this is to support long-term conservation for sensitive um, nature features, as well as for the comfort of park users of all ages and abilities. So in addition to the community feedback, other um, key points that informed this direction are that park visitation, including dogs, are anticipated to increase here um, alongside the adjacent development, perhaps even more than Havenwood Park. And there is existing evidence of dog impacts being off trail in the park currently. Latoya Creek Park's current network of trail and just its its shape and form and, and how people access and use the park is different in that there's a primary trail and really all users are experiencing the park through the same space. So there aren't the same opportunities for secondary spaces to try and manage users and reduce potential for, for conflicts of different groups. And finally, um, the review of other similar jurisdictions to Colwood where municipal bylaw most commonly required dogs be on leash in all public places except designated off-leash areas, whereas Colwood's existing bylaw, which includes this park, is for dogs to be under control, which allows dogs off-leash. This is more similar we encounter to bylaws that exist in rural areas or some regional district parks. And so a key kind of, uh, I guess, bigger picture thought here is anticipating that as the city continues to grow, adapting the bylaw for public spaces and park spaces will be important for continued comfort and enjoyment of all users. I'll leave plan highlights there and touch briefly on next steps and then welcome any questions um, that council may have. So we've been really pleased with the progress of the project and plan to date and key next steps for phase three, the final phase include referral of the draft plans to the community and stakeholders, um, as well as then coming back and completing and reviewing revisions um, with staff based on comments from Council and the public and so the intention is to carry out revisions through February with the aim of finalizing the plans in March. With that, uh, I thank you all very much for time this evening. Um, we're so excited to be supporting the community in Colwood for these two really key parks for the next 10 years and beyond. Thank you very much, Kate. I'm just going to open the floor for questions. Councillor yes. Day. Thank you. Um, I could be uh, incorrect, but um, I believe that the acquisition of the area that is now Havenwood Park in the 1970s was not actually for housing, it was uh, for green space uh, under the um, Dave Barrett NDP government. And uh, it did formerly belong to Wolfgang Gulick, who lobbied uh, various groups uh, since uh, around uh, 2000 and 2001 uh, to acquire this park by meeting with each uh, different group uh, separately, taking them into the park and asking them if they didn't feel calmer and better when they were in the park. And universally, all of the differing groups uh, agreed with Wolfgang that it was a very special place. Um, and, uh, it, it led to a unanimous decision and included um, Langford partnering uh, on the purchase of the park. Uh, also not included in the history was the 1999 um, Colwood Greenways Committee that myself mm -hmm. and Judith Cullington sat on. Uh, Judith was the chair uh, along with several um, residents of Colwood who uh, brought forward recommendation to for uh, acquisition of additional parkland uh, and actually set the stage um, for the way that we've laid out our parks in Collwood, which is to make them as connected as possible for the natural uh, plants and animals that live there to support one another. Um, so I just thought that was important to bring forward since I am the old lady at the table with the history. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to um, ask about um, just the way it was uh, laid out, the vision statement uh, on page 66 of her agenda says, it's for the benefit of community residents, um, which, 
I just really felt that uh, our vision should include the protection of the environment and the preservation of the plants and animals. Um, we all have houses here. Um, we've kicked out an awful lot of plants and animals <laughs> to make room for us. Uh, so this is our, our little place that we saved for them, I hope, um, that we could share with them. Um, the other comment uh, that I had for the plan, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Hat once the referrals are done as to whether or not we've met uh, the expectations that we laid out in that covenant, uh, because we felt that this park uh, was so important to the community uh, that we really needed um, an arm's length third party to ensure that nobody lost that vision over time to, pr to protect the nature of the park. And uh, I love the idea of putting in the park toilet. Um, that is uh, a really important necessity for any group to be in the park for any amount of time. So whether we're doing uh, a nature program with youth or we're doing uh, a volunteer broom bash that makes a huge difference. Uh, and just to highlight, I really appreciated that the user-friendly trail guide was mentioned in the write-up um, and to be included for the signage. Um, it's a little hard to wrap your head around, but once you get it, um, you'll never go back because instead of saying, yes, you can do this trail, even if you're in a wheelchair, it says, here's what the trail is. So if you think you can do it, go ahead. Here's what you can find there. Um, and that, that really speaks to avoiding liability. We didn't tell them this was, you know, going to work perfectly for you. It, it may have some challenges for some people and, uh, many people will be able to overcome them. Uh, I'd like to highlight that um, it has always been my vision to try to establish an accessible loop in Havenwood Park. And one area where I think that could be achieved shows up in the plan with the new trail that links from the main trail at the bottom of the stairs to the main trail not that far on the other side of that uh, wetland area. Um, so that, that is potentially an excellent location for some of the picnic tables that are talked about in the report uh, so that it could be an accessible destination for someone who chose to try this as their accessible adventure. Uh, onto La Toria Creek Park, um, I found it difficult because it's not a topographical map that we're looking at to really understand the changes that are proposed on the east side trail closer to the, um, it's kind of midpoint towards uh, Pelican. And that, um, that trail turned out very narrow I would guess maybe it's two feet wide right now. It, it's very um, much cobbled together on a steep slope. Um, it's where the, the very steep trail is going to be removed that comes kind of straight down into the creek. Uh, but I'd love to hear um, how that's going to, going to work because uh, there are significant changes and there were significant challenges in creating those trails. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, um, because a lot of the plan is about advising on ecosystem regeneration, uh, who on our staff is actually qualified to advise on that? Because it's not something that I'm aware of as having really that skill set. That's kind of why we went to HAT and why we 
um, looked externally. So I'm just wondering, is that something we have or something we need to get? Through the chair. So typically, if there's not an expertise on staff, we would bring in a third party to review, um, such as HAS in the different instances and or uh, an RP bio or someone dependent upon which we're trying to look at for that situation. So you'll we'll often bring an arborist, for instance, to help us out with tree considerations. And we would do the same when it comes to, say, stream considerations with a registered biologist and the like. Right. So on on our uh, budgetary side in, in the recommendations, it, it identifies that being staff time. And uh, I'm just uh, I, I want to be really crystal clear that it is really important to me that we get it right. Um, if HAT is going to help us with Havenwood, maybe they'd be willing to look at doing a little bit of work with us in Latoria Creek Park as well. Uh, I don't know. Just a suggestion. Um, and that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jordison. Um, I just have uh, some comments about Havenwood Park and um, I, I appreciate the engagement with the, with the public and in, in formalizing these, um, these reports, but I wonder uh, when we, when as a city, do we look at and take note of um, other reports that have been provided by experts like Dunster and Associates environmental consultants that state that the current conditions in Havenwood Park show presence of several tree diseases, including extensive areas of laminate, laminated root rot and stem decay, and that many trees are in severe decline and show very clear signs in the uh, of this of the rot in the crown foliage, along with obvious signs of drought stress, and uh, which might be exacerbating the exasperating the disease issues. Um, I guess I'm concerned about uh, asking the residents and you know people to provide input on what we should do for second, third in the park when. Uh, there may not be a park if we don't start um, protecting and restoring the forested areas and monitoring them first, you know, uh, at the, and making it a priority for the safety of visitors and, and just ensuring the viability of the park before making further improvements. And so I just wonder where that is considered. And I, I do see it as a short term, um, as short term that we're going to be looking at that and it's going to be working on that. But are we doing enough at this point? Um, does, does the city not have some liability in this um, if trees fall? And you know, um, we've been advised that this that this park has rot and disease. So through the chair. So recommendations within the Havenwood Park uh, draft management plan. There's four specific related to um, both bedrock outcrops, meadows then um, to protect, restore, and monitor the riparian area, and then a similar one for the forest area. So some of the recommendations within this plan seek to further investigate and gain clarity on that uh, as the context is today. Uh, we do um, monitor the tree considerations within the park, and we do, through the parks department, maintain, remove as needed and as necessary as deemed by arborists and such. Okay, thank you. Council Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so on both parks, first on Havenwood, um, I'm admittedly a neophyte when it comes to uh, to parks. I love being out in the woods. I do a lot of backcountry hiking, but I don't know the first thing about tree health. Um, but I do have concerns with the, I wonder if anywhere in the planning we've um, considered or adapted to what's happened on the north side of the park with the development there and the deforestation. Is there any threat to trees, particularly potentially unhealthy trees from the deforestation. Um, and the only example I can really think of is Cathedral Grove. If anyone's gone through there lately, you see the deforestation right up to the line on the map has a significant impact beyond the line on the map into the park. So that concerns me. Um, secondly, just on Latoria Creek Park, um, page 61, item 1 1.7, um, which speaks to, um, opportunities uh, with the South Latoria development with Gablecraft to 
it says here to retain the ridge trail along the eastern edge of the park, but that trail is gone now. I know I spent a lot of time in that park and they bulldozed that down when they when they took out the trees and what is figure one in terms of area to be retained. Um, so I wonder if there's been any conversations in this short term time frame with Gablecraft to reconsider the uh, reestablishment of a loop trail there. I know it's uh, it was incredibly popular with um, with people that live in the area, there's a significant opportunity for some some really nice viewpoints um, to create a loop all the way around, which I know is is loosely mentioned here. And then speaking to what um, Councillor Day mentioned earlier around ac accessibility, the grade coming in from Latoria into a potential, um, I guess, eastern section of a loop trail would be such that you know, you could create a, a quite an accessible trail up along that ridge with viewpoints and things with uh, either an egress on the Machosan side or, you know, an out and back trail. So, so I know it's two questions in one go, but that's how I uh, tricked the mayor into giving me a second. <laughs> so through the chair, uh, Kate, I'll take your crack at the Latoria one and then I'll turn it over to you for the other piece. So uh, through development of this plan, we have been uh, consulting with the adjacent developer for the lands to the south. They are they do have the approved Latoria Park South plan that has recently been uh, supported. We do strive to part, plan our parks for what's to come. We know there's development and parks coming adjacent to these lands. We want to ensure that there's connectivity from what we have today and plan for what we're going to have for tomorrow. So you'll see some key connection pieces. Those are meant to be a guide as to where things are to come as the planning parks comes forth in the South Latoria lands there as well. Um, that dotted ridge trail is kind of like a tertiary third piece that sort of exists in pieces and such right now. Um, but predominantly we would like to see trail connectivity go north to south through the park um, on that giant red line that is not in front of you right now, but is on page 20 within the document itself. And then I will turn it over to Kate for any more comment. And then the first question, which I've already forgotten. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess just to further um, what Jill is speaking to, we're, we were very much working from the established parks plan, which was done in advance of this plan, and looking to where within the park boundaries there were because there is the existing park boundary boundaries, there are a few negotiated additional pieces of parkland that are highlighted on the figures in the report that have come about as a result of discussions, um, the discussions to this date for the adjacent Latoria South. And so we were looking for our best opportunities within um, this city's parkland in order to maintain some access along that eastern side, um, as you're referencing Councillor Ward. So at this point, this is, um, this is what we were able to achieve within um, the existing background uh, and documents and agreements that are in place. As far as um, your, if I've got it right, um, your comment for Havenwood, um, you're absolutely astute in recognizing, you know, even a non-forest expert, um, when you have an intact and comprehensive system, it's not just each tree, it, it works as a system. And so a big part of both of these plans is also looking to several different levers of how to protect um, and expand upon lands for the park and the adjacent areas and how to go about um, managing what undeveloped land adja exists adjacent to the parks. Um, for each of them, that land is becoming less. And so um, the plan does have recommendations and speaks to where the opportunities or the key opportunities are um, for protection and, and increased acquisition and a prioritization list in terms of what the categories would be to consider um, to consider those efforts if there was opportunity in future. For Havenwood Park, there is a rather large um, parcel of land that's owned by the school district, for example. And so, so that's something that is of consideration in the big picture, you know, how could that, um, how could that evolve in the future potentially to continue um, the protection and, and role that a kind of unified natural space has currently for Havenwood Park. Great, thank you both. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Grove. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, um, uh, right. So the, uh, thank you uh, very much for the presentation. The parks are uh, important. They obviously cost money. And so it'll be interesting to try to balance this because we all love parks. Um, one thing I was going to comment on was the toilets, which is a great idea, but the, in the Highlands, they have built and continue to maintain 
uh, composting toilet. It's a natural nature toilet, which you probably know about. If you do, if you don't, check it out. It's a great idea and it helps us show some leadership in the environmental realm, I believe. Um, our um, the fellow councillors on the Highland Council there, uh, Gordon and Barrett, actually, uh, EcoSense House have built that and continue, I believe, to be the folks that maintain it. Um, it's uh, an alternate. I was going to ask you a question where it says continue the cooperative management model. Is that uh, connected to Haven Friends, our friends of our friends at the Friends of Havenwood? Um, th through the chair. Oh, sorry, maybe John, I thought that you go there. And go ahead, Kate. We're going to say the same thing. So. <laughs> the disadvantage of being on Zoom, I couldn't see that you're about to respond right there. My apologies. Um, yes, that is the intention. It's a combination of both. Um, there's a collective, actually. It's Friends of Havenwood Park, as well as Habitat Acquisition Trust um, and the, the Land Conservancy as well. So right now, under the covenant, there's actually a collection of parties um, that also includes the city of Langford. And it's really a collaborative effort that has enabled some of the successes. Um, a, a very big note of credit of which is the Friends of Havenwood Park. Fair enough. And uh, that will be continued then, it looks like, into the Latoria Creek. You just expand this notion of uh, this cooperative management model. Sounds good. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Okay. I'd like to think that's all the questions. I, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, Kate, this was, these both these uh, parks uh, plans were extremely well written. Obviously, you're not an engineer. Uh, <laughs> I'll take that but as a compliment, were, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> and that's a compliment, yes. Uh, they were very well written, and you know, and uh, I just really didn't have a lot of comment on them. I, I, I thought that uh, the whole premise of keeping it as natural as possible was phenomenal. It just met every one of my objectives there. So well done. Thank you very much. I can get a, a motion for, uh, oops, uh, Councillor Jensen. Thank you, Worship. I was going to move the motion or the recommendation uh, for option one, which is council endorse the draft park management plan for Haven Park and Victoria Creek Park for the purpose of seeking final public and stakeholder feedback. Okay, great. Seconder, Councilor Grove. All the question. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, uh, item 8.3, this is just for information only, and Nafisa, I hope I pronounced that your name correctly, you're on. Thanks, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I start with introducing myself, um, because it's my first time um, presenting in the Council. Uh, I'm Nakhisa Rashidian Par, uh, the new parks planner of the city of Colwood. And I'm uh, just um, giving this presentation to inform the uh, Council um, of the National Urban Parks Project. So, um, Nafisa, can, can I get you just to move the, your mic a little closer to you? Yeah, that's perfect. good enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so this presentation is intended to provide the council with an update on the Colwood National Urban Parks project. So I will give you a little bit of background of the project. Uh, Government of Canada has funded the creation of um, up to six national urban parks by 2026 through urban parks program. In this regard, Parks Canada is collaborating with partners, including Indigenous people uh, to create a network of um, national urban parks in Canada's large urban centers. Parks Canada has um, drafted a national urban parks policy. Um, oh, sorry. No, that's right. Oh, my apologies. Um, Parks Canada has drafted a national urban parks policy in which the connected elements of um, conserving nature, connecting people with nature, and advancing reconciliation with Indigenous people are identified as the um, main three cores of the national urban parks project. Uh, as now, Parks Canada is um, 
working with uh, six urban park, um, urban areas to explore the potential national urban parks, as you see in the slide. And um, one of the six candidate sites um, is in Greater uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Through a statement of a collaboration, uh, Parks Canada has um, Parks Canada and City of Colwood have agreed to conduct a feasibility studies of potential designation national urban parks in Colwood with Sky Malt and Sun Peace Nation collaboration. Um, therefore, uh, Parks Canada and City of Colwood have signed a contribution agreement that emphasizes on the three key activities of uh, one, ecosystem regeneration strategy. Um, two, uh, public transit and tax, uh, active transportation strategy. And the three is the engagement process um, strategy. The milestones of these three key activities project um, are shown in the table um, by Q4 2022 as the MeCheck mid check um sorry midpoint check-in of the project with the partners um it is proposed that um uh, these strategies will be developed and um, um it's going to be including ecosystem regeneration strategy active and public transportation studies and engagement uh, summary strategies and these strategies will be um, drafted uh, by Q1 and Q2 2023. Um, this table um, um, as presented um, um, is to inform the council of the allocated funds uh, to these three key project activities in a timely manner. Uh, Parks Canada has agreed to pay contribution to the city of Colwood to implement this project. And as proposed, um, the next step of the project um, includes implementation of the pre-feasibility assessments, uh, ongoing outreach and collaboration with uh, Parks Canada and Sky Modern Songhees Nation and develop the strategy uh, for the draft policy. Thanks, and thank you so much. Uh, any questions from Council? <clears throat> Councillor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nafisa. It was a pleasure. I had, a, I had a question. Do we have a diagram, really, or any rendering of what the boundaries of this park is going to look like or what it's going to encompass? Sure. Thanks for the great question, Councillor. Um, the project is at the very early stages of the project. Um, as we have been worked so far, it's around the national um, side of Fora Hill. Uh, we started our studies from there. That's what we're considering right now. And we are working on the pre-feasibility of the project, but the, the, uh, it's really rough for the boundaries right now. And it's a really flexible, depending um, our studies as it goes, and then we will have our borders of the parks that we are uh, proposing. I mean, there's some obvious parts that will be included, but I I'm keen to sort of hear what's gonna happen in and around the lagoon uh, area and uh, sort of the forested area below Belmont Park, uh, sure. that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, if I wanna give you a little bit more um, exact, um, uh, like the location, uh, we are considering National Forest Hill. There is a green patch around the uh, Ocean Boulevard um, on north, and on south of uh, National, um, sorry, Ocean Boulevard, um, just uh, on the um, north side of the Squamish Lagoon. There is a green patch, and uh, like um, as you mentioned, Belmont Park. These are the area that we are considering right now. Uh, but it might be extended to Sky Mall Lagoon. It could be extended further, or it just could be just around that area. 
Thank you. Uh, this is awesome. I love this idea. And I know this has been percolating for some time. And uh, I believe this is unique to have these sort of this, this urban park, this federal urban park in our community. I think that uh, it, it, uh, the future is bright for us in this regard. And I think this is uh, something that we could uh, certainly um, showcase, uh, you know, the community in the future. And, uh, yeah, so I think this is a big win. It's been coming for some time. Uh, thank you so much. Councillor Day. Thank you. Hi, Nafisa. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I think that it's really, um, it, it really fits well with the previous two park plans that we were just talking about because we're looking at the whole ecosystem and ecosystem regeneration. And some of the areas that you've mentioned um, to Councillor Jansen uh, are really important uh, areas. Oh, one of them I just know is a heron nesting zone, for example. So there is a lot of really special areas here. Uh, so I'm hoping that you will share uh, with our future parks committee. I don't think we've got there yet on our agenda tonight, but um, this ecosystem regeneration strategy, because we have three areas in Colwood that we're currently working on to preserve and protect those ecosystems. So I'm sure that the project that you're working on will also provide us with valuable information that can inform those other processes as well. Thank you very yes. much. I, I just have um, one, just one quick question. Um, I see the value in doing this and, and I share uh, uh, Councillor Jensen's uh, comments. <clears throat> the, one, the one issue that is sort of is in my head right now is that there is no, um, there's no emphasis on the historic value of, the, of Fort Rod Hill. Like I don't see that in the objectives. So is that sort of off the table then? Um, there is a consideration of that regarding the whole um, idea of the national urban parks because it's around the nature and culture combining uh, like both together. And um, since we have the national um, national site around Fora Hill, it makes that to be um, sort of um, more opportunity to. Um, um, continue the conversation with the Pox Canada. So it is definitely a consideration, but at this point, like what we are considering right now are the three main projects. And I need to mention something that I'm thinking as um, the Pox planner uh, for the ecosystem regeneration strategy, I'm considering both ecological, uh, ecological restoration and social restoration. So probably social restoration would be connected to the uh, historic side of the project. Great. Thank you very much, Nafisa. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Council. Yeah. Okay, we'll go on to 8.4, uh, building permit fee amendment. Byron, Grant. Good evening, Council. Get prepared here. Could have done that the whole time, but okay. So um, I do not have a presentation prepared for tonight, but I did put together a brief overview. So um, big ticket buildings on the horizon, such as the collection and research facility for the BC Museum, have caused staff to review building permit fees for buildings of this nature. This specific cost has not been provided yet, but we have an idea of what it could be. Uh, the review of the building permit requires involvement from our city fire, engineering, development, and building teams throughout the application process and construction. While a building rolls 
So I think while building officials' role is even more important with buildings such as this, staff recommend reducing fees for buildings like this as they would exceed the cost of providing the service. Colwood currently has fees for building permits that are competitive in the region and are similar to Langford, Oak Bay, and Sydney. Higher building permit fees are levied in Victoria, Saanich, and the Capital Regional District, for example. For context, multi-unit residential buildings in Colwood are typically well under $50 million in construction value, and this recommended change would only capture buildings with exorbitant size and value. As an example, on a building that has a construction value of $100 million, excuse me, the proposed amendment would result in a building permit fee collected of around $500,000 as opposed to $800,000. Staff believe this proposed change more, would more ad- accurately reflect the cost for service. I'd be happy to answer any questions council may have about the proposed amendment. Councillor Dave. Thank you. So I'm just curious because um, we don't, obviously, this isn't something that would come along every day. This is something unusual for the city. And usually when we've had uh, larger buildings come forward or anticipated larger buildings coming forward, they generally required perhaps a higher level of training than what we normally have on staff or had on staff in the past. And um, it, it was kind of uh, dealt with perhaps on a, on a per item basis. So I'm just curious why we would want to amend this in advance of anything coming forward when we could, in fact, uh, modify uh, um, our building permit fees on a case-by-case basis when we had more information that would inform that decision. So us just blue skying it, we don't really know what we're talking about or what it might cost us to do the work required. But when we have a specific project come in, I'm thinking of other projects where, you know, developers have agreed to pay for an additional staff person for the city of Colwood to help them evaluate something or um, those types of situations have come up in the past. So I'm just wondering, why are we being proactive here? Thank you for the question and through the chair. Um, Comparing to other municipalities or sometimes just simply a, a percentage of what the proposed construction value will be. So, excuse me, uh, as an example, uh, one of our neighboring municipalities just collects uh, close to 1% of what the proposed construction value will be. Uh, a more common tiered system is as the building gets more expensive, the fees go down more. So. As Colwood is growing, we're starting to see, or you know, we're for, foreshadowing bigger, more expensive buildings. And when we break that down and look at what the fee is that's collected, we feel that as we grow bigger, we need to add another tier for where those fees would be reduced. So it is a bit more granular the way that we calculate our building permit fees compared to some which just simply take a percentage, but. We always want to defend that um, that we're actually capturing that appropriate fee for the service provided. But I don't know if that answers your question directly, but happy to elaborate. Yeah, I understand what you're saying that, you know, everyone's property values are going up. I mean, once we got our assessment notice of yippee, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I'm just an ordinary person. I guess we're all millionaires now. But, um, uh, you know, really uh, the values of things are changing such that um, I can see why you would consider it. But I also wonder if we wouldn't be in a better position to make this decision on a case-by-case basis. Through to the chair, if I may. Um, 
So we do get granular in the sense that we have a software program that we use to analyze what the declared value of construction is from the uh, from the developer or builder. So depending on the type of building, we use a software ourselves uh, that we feel is very accurate to uh, the cost of construction. And it's also current with um, with our, our local area for building costs for materials. So when there was a spike in materials, it reflects that. So it's it's live essentially to what construction is costing. So your fees can stay the same. Um, and then they also follow that as construction gets more expensive. And when you work with developers who, um, let me put this as politely as I can, um, who believe they've met all the requirements that we have when they submit their plans, et cetera, and then later discover that maybe they hadn't actually met all the requirements that we have, uh, we're prepared to, you know, that may cause additional inspections or additional costs to the municipality uh, in trying to accommodate those developments. Uh, do we capture that in our fees? I would say only in the fact, I mean, some projects go well um, for developers and some don't. Um, I'd say that in a, in a sense, it balances itself out that way. I mean, if things are not going well, and if we find ourselves going back um, and chasing our tails a bit, so to speak, we do use a reinspection fee if need be. So, um, you know, if we um, feel like there's a bit of a, a blatant, you know, dis, uh, disregard of our time, then we'll use that fee. We try to avoid it, but um, in a sense, that does capture some of that extra time used. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you. Uh, I think I got the gist of it. Uh, the ideas for uh, cost recovery for these fees, not extortion. And then uh, at the end, uh, when we hit that $50 million mark, uh, you're saying that there's really no additional cost on the staff time. Uh, is, is that my, my read here? I would say there is additional staff time. It's just reduced past a certain point. So uh, when you're looking at some of the scale of the buildings that we might see here in Colwood, um, and you stand back and look at the fees, I'd say that um, it's not like there's no more staff time, but it's reasonable to, to reduce the fee incrementally, similar to as it's structured right now. Um, you know, there's certain thresholds at 100,000, 400,000, um, and we're proposing to add another tier where that fee is further reduced. Okay, uh, thank you. I think I got that. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to uh, put forward uh, the recommended uh, option number one. I'll just hold, hold you one until I get comments. Okay. Councilor Ward. Just a quick question, Byron, um, obviously is, not only am I a neophyte on forestry, I'm a neophyte on uh, on building permit costs as well. But I know that we're linking it to um, to construction costs, and then I see in other municipalities there is a service index per square meter, and there's a wide variance um, depending on the complexity of the construction. And I, I just wonder if that's something we take into account. Like, you know, if you're building a recreational facility with a swimming pool and, and a large degree of engineering components and things, that's different than, you know, a Costco warehouse that's a shell. So are we confident that, you know, lining things up with, and, and maybe this is a bigger question, but, are, you know, the, the model that we're using it, you know, should we even be um, you know, considering a reduction or anything, we don't know whether it's going to be a, a, a simple shell or if it's going to be something incredibly complex. Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, I think it's on the basis of what we discussed a little bit earlier, but um, that program that we use, so when someone submits a, a building permit application, they'll put, um, they'll declare a cost of construction on that. And then this software that we use is essentially as granular um, uh, as you want it to be. And there are no 
um, unforeseen circumstances with construction at that building permit application stage. So we know what we're gonna get when that plan is submitted. Um, the only example I can think of if there's a um, an empty portion left for a, a tenant improvement or something along those lines, but you'd still know if it was you know going to be used for a mercantile use or an office use or something of that like. So um, I feel that you could still calculate that uh, that cost and compare it to what was declared accurately. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm. Um, I was I had mixed emotions on this one. I can tell you that because. Uh, you know, theoretically, uh, you don't want to gouge, you know, the, the customer, right? Uh, the whole idea is that you're not supposed to make a profit on that. You're supposed to recover your costs. And I understand we cost it at a fully burdened cost, which is great. So, but to Councillor Day's point, I, I don't understand, like, like you just said, we don't build a lot of $50 million plus buildings. And I certainly, and I thought to myself, uh, I was giving some advice, you know, we win some, we lose some, but it all evens out. The only problem, if we lose on something that's of that size and magnitude, that's a big loss. You know, we'd have to have a lot of gains to, to, to make up for that type of loss. So I guess where I'm just feeling so uncomfortable about this, uh, uh, going with this motion is that what, what if we, because of the fact that we don't have experience, what if we, what if we blow it here? I mean, and no fault to anyone right now. So I'm not feeling comfortable with this. I, I just don't understand why we just can't say we'll recover our costs, whatever they may be. And and, and so we'll call it a day. I, I don't know if we can do that, but it, I feel a lot more comfortable because you know what? If we get it wrong, someone's going to wave this piece of paper in our face and say, hey, you agreed to this. But yet, yet, you know, if we get it, you know, if we just leave it as is and it's high, you know, but we'd have to have the integrity to ensure that we're only billing for what our costs were, our fully burdened costs. I would feel a lot more comfortable uh, and, and I, that's defensible to our taxpayers. That's how I feel about this. And, and that's why I'm having a hard time supporting this. I, like I said, I went back and forth on it. I'm trying to do the ethical thing, but the ethical thing is also to make sure that all my costs are covered and only charge for that. That's ethical. I wouldn't have an issue with that. Food for thought, if I may. Mm -hmm, yeah, so um, when it does come to a larger, you call it more complex building such as this, you'll also see a higher level of professionalism involved in that, um, a, a more broad gamut of professionals involved, which does give us um, as building officials that, that peace of mind that there will be that added level of professionalism. Um, so... Um, in my experience, I'd, I'd actually feel more comfortable in a situation like this um, where you can actually build a three-story apartment uh, without the amount of professionals that we see. So, um, you know, something to consider when it comes to that. Okay. So, and it's not fair for me to ask this question, but I'm going to ask you the question um, because my decision is going to depend on what you say. So you say this, you say you come up with this number and you, you know what, what our facility is being built over at the, with the Royal BC Museum. Will you, Byron, stand by that number? I mean, would you stand by that number? I'm very confident that if this amendment was made, um, we wouldn't be kicking ourselves for it. Okay. okay. On that project. Okay. Your Worship, if I may. Yes, please, Mr. Earl. I knew you were going to pipe in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, relative to uh, Councillor Day's point, so if, if an application were to come in, um, the bylaw of the day needs to apply. And so if you were to make a change relative to an application that came in the door, it wouldn't apply to that application. So we don't have the benefit of kind of seeing that application. We're actively working uh, with this particular owner. And so we've got a pretty good feeling about the, the valuation of this structure when it comes in. And we've got an increasingly deeper understanding of the complexity of the facility and the nature of time that it's going to take our team uh, to do the work required in the permitting process. Over the past years, we've seen increasingly complex buildings and through that have built a body of knowledge of the time it takes for our teams to provide those necessary services. That gives us confidence uh, that uh, the
the fees that we're collecting are uh, generous to the point that they are uh, uh, fully supporting the, the indirect costs, the direct costs and the overhead costs of the, of the organization to the point where administration are feeling discomfortable with the fee schedule relative to a high building such that we're in this chamber. Is it governments, local governments included, have an obligation when it comes to fee to create a nexus between the fee schedule and the cost of providing the service. In this instance, administration believe that our current fee structure for high value buildings, those above 50 million, has the capacity to generate fees beyond uh, our expectations of the costs involved to administer the service. And as such, we're recommending that we come back and add an additional tier. Okay. Thank you very much. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay, uh, Councilor Jansen, we still would you like to make the motion then? Okay, can I get a second here then, please? Councilor Grove, call the question. All in favor? Those opposed? Oh, it's defeated. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Jordison, Councillor Day, Mayor Kobayashi, and Councillor Ward uh, are opposed. Defeated. Okay, next item 8.5 uh, Policing Facilities Expansion Project. Uh, Mr. Earl, you're, you're on. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. As uh, Council is aware that... Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Earl, I'm just going to take a, 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 a five-minute uh, health health break here, and uh, if that's okay with you, and uh, we'll everybody be back for uh, in five minutes, please.
Are we ready to go, Mr. Earl? Thank you, Mr. As uh, Council is aware, uh, the City of Colwood, uh, together with the City of Langford and the Town of View Royal, uh, jointly deliver our policing services in our communities through the RCMP. Uh, under contract, we're responsible to provide office, garage, and jail facilities under the Municipal Police Service Agreement. The West Shore Detachment at 698 Atkins Avenue in Langford is undersized uh, to meet the needs of our future population and our feasibility study findings indicate expanding the existing facility is the recommended course of action. So I'm here uh, this evening uh, to make a recommendation to council, a two-part recommendation that the city of Colwood uh, approve a budget of $291,720 to advance uh, the police facilities expansion project. That number represents Colwood's portion uh, of 24% of 1.2 million that's required uh, to bring uh, this concept to a validation stage. And this amount would be funded from the City of Colwood's Police Building Reserve Fund. Second part of the motion is that uh, uh, Mayor Kobayashi and this uh, Colwood CAO and myself be appointed to a joint police facilities steering committee made up of the mayors of View Royal, uh, Langford and Colwood and the CAOs of the same uh, to oversee the process of advancement of further project definition. Uh, by way of background, uh, the three communities jointly own uh, the West Shore Detachment at 698 Atkins Avenue. Uh, it is a two-part building, one part built in the 60s, that's approximately 10,600 square feet, and the other part built in 1999. Uh, that's 26,000 square feet for a total of about 37,000 square feet. Uh, that detachment as reported uh, by the RCMP is uh, nearing its capacity and our, as our communities continue to grow, an expanded uh, facility is required. And as described uh, through the, our policing agreement, we're required to provide that facility. Uh, so the three communities got together and went through a process uh, to determine how to move forward from here. A 20-year planning horizon was chosen uh, to align with what is likely to be debt, certainly on Colwood's uh, part. It is administration's recommendation that a debt financing be used for our portion of the building, and it's my expectation uh, that the other two communities will also uh, be utilizing debt financing. Uh, so with a 20-year time horizon, then we needed to look at what the populations of the jurisdictions would be um, at the end of that cycle. On page two of seven of the report, you will see uh, we moved from a collective 2021 population of just over 85,832 uh, people to a 2045 population of 167,000 uh, 301. You'll see on the far right-hand column of that report, uh, each community used a different growth estimate over that uh, time span to attempt to determine the size of their population at that time. We then needed to go through a process to estimate uh, how many policing resources we might need at that time. And so we relied on the RCMP and we relied on uh, the experience of other uh, policing jurisdictions to look at how many officers uh, those jurisdictions had per population at the estimated future populations. And so for uh, View Royal uh, and uh, Colwood and Machosen, a future uh, one to 875 was used for the purposes of estimating the size of the RCMP, uh, and then for Highlands, one to, to 930, and for the city of Langford, one to 750. There is a, a experience in policing jurisdictions in Canada that the larger you get, the more police you need per thousand. As your density increases, your uh, need for policing per thousand people increases. And so it's not a, a linear straight line. Uh, that brought us to an, a number of 210 RCMP. We currently have 
for every three RCMP, one administrative staff, we add those in that brought us to an FT, a future FTE total of 281. We are currently at 147 uh, for context. Uh, we then asked uh, the RCMP for their advice on uh, a detachment of that size. What's the size of facility uh, required? Uh, we received from them that number of 92,417 square feet. Uh, we then compared kind of our current population serve, if you look at page three of seven, uh, and the chart on the bottom, uh, to kind of the size of our existing facility, 37,000 square feet, uh, and our current FTE count of 147. And so we have approximately 252 feet square per FTE. If we looked at the future uh, building that we might build, uh, that would be 167,000 population served, uh, and that would come to 329 feet per. And if we looked at a comparable, uh, Kelowna currently serves a population of 142,000 uh, with a 314 FTE count or 338 square feet per person. And so we did that comparative analysis to uh, check the math, if you will, of the RCMP provided number of 92,417 to support uh, an RCMP total of 210, but with administrative up to 281. We then looked further, and uh, there's an appendice attached in this report that looked at, should we uh, build new or redevelop existing? And um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions relative to the specifics of the assumptions in the report or its outputs, but the recommendation at the end of the day was uh, to um, demolish the 1960 portion and rebuild uh, in its place a, a structure, keeping the 1999 portion, bringing it up to a kind of modern seismic code uh, and making some environmental improvements at the same time. That uh, was the kind of most uh, life cycle cost-effective approach rather than building new uh, in a new location. Uh, we then uh, got a cost estimate on uh, building at that size in that location uh, with that approach, uh, brought us to uh, a building construction, sorry, uh, 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 an estimated cost of 82.4 million. That includes building to a net zero standard, that includes building to a post-disaster standard, that includes uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, the acquisition of additional properties for more surface parking. It includes price escalation at 3.5% per year through to the year 2024, uh, with the belief that that would be our embarkation year for uh, construction, uh, and then project delivery and contingency costs on top of that at 12%. Uh, and 15%. So that's where we got to the 82.4 million. Currently, we divide operating costs of the facility based on a formula that's 50% population based and 50% assessment based. So for 2021, Colwood's portion of uh, operating costs would be 24%. Uh, arguably, we could go through a process to future cast what that would be uh, at the end of that 20 year life cycle. To, to look at kind of uh, how these numbers would change over time. For context, uh, in 1999, when Colwood uh, uh, was a partner in that building construction, uh, we were 35% of the building. And so our portion, or we have grown uh, at, a, at a slower pace relative to certainly one of the partners. 24% of uh, 82.4 million brings Colwood's estimated capital cost to 20.1 million. Uh, the three CAOs have met and gone through what would be a process to determine how we would procure uh, a building or uh, an upgrade like this should we move forward. Uh, we have jointly recommended uh, uh, an integrated uh, procurement approach. And so uh, the recommendation this evening uh, is to provide Colwood's portion, 24% of the uh, funds needed 
uh, and the funds needed will be 1.2 million to continue to advance uh, the design to a point uh, where we will bring uh, uh, it to a decision on whether or not to proceed. Uh, should the three communities uh, fund the 1.2 million, that process would take a further six months. And at the end of that six month time, uh, the three communities would make decisions uh, individually and or collectively on whether or not to proceed. Simultaneous to that, uh, because Colwood's portion of this building, should uh, it proceed, would be debt financing, we would need to go through a process either subsequent or parallel uh, with the public for uh, the, uh, with debt financing, there's a public approval process. And we would need to go through that process and the public would weigh in on their perspectives on whether or not uh, this project should proceed. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, our uh, contract with uh, the RCMP for policing services uh, runs until 2032. At, at, at that point, uh, Colwood uh, could make a decision to uh, move in a different direction uh, or uh, continue with RCMP uh, services. Colwood's experience with kind of the policing through the RCMP has proven uh, both service and cost effective. And so it's administration's belief at this juncture that uh, Colwood's position would be to continue with RCMP services to provide our policing services in the fullness of time and to invest in structures and facilities and support to support that um, over a lifespan going beyond uh, 2032. Current borrowing indicative borrowing rate for a, a 30 year borrow is 4.14% for municipalities. And so uh, $20 million with that indicative borrowing rate would uh, convert to an annual payment of approximately 1.3 million over the 20 years, sorry, 30 years, 1.5 million if you did a, a 20 year borrow. This evening, Colwood is, is looking for a, a decision from council to support uh, the budget from our police building uh, reserve uh, to continue Colwood's portion in this process. It will be a collective process. The three jurisdictions are going to need uh, to work cooperatively uh, to move uh, this initiative forward. Colwood uh, cannot uh, do this absent the other players. Uh, and so we're looking for Colwood support tonight. Uh, and um, the other two communities will be looking for the same within this month, is my expectation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I'll open it up for questions. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's a great synopsis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Earl. Um, and to get to this point, we've eliminated uh, some of the other options that were discussed along the way, things like uh, offsite space, you know, leased offsite space, construction of a building in another location to augment the current building. Like a variety of these options have been explored by your uh, committee along the way, I'm assuming. The committee ha has looked at different time scales, has, has looked at uh, multiple building approaches. The belief set of the committee is from a full life cycle costing perspective, redevelopment of the existing site, or a portion of the existing site and, and uh, recap, uh, refurbishment and recapitalization of the 1999 building is the most cost effective to continue policing services in the manner in which they're currently provided. It's the belief of the three jurisdictions that uh, in 20 years, the community's uh, growth is estimated to keep the existing facility generally in the center of that uh, enhanced density over time. Thank you. Um, the district of Machosen, uh, where do they fit into this building? And, and can you speak to that at all? Sure. I mean, 
As you're aware, uh, Machosen has crossed the 5,000 threshold with the last census. When you cross that threshold, you're, you are now responsible as a local government to provide policing services. An ongoing conversation is occurring between Machosen and the province about that transition. It's my expectation uh, that there's a good probability that Machosen's policing uh, could occur from the West Shore detachment. If that were to be the case, they would be a leasee or a tenant uh, and would be billed out on a per officer or a per FTE perspective, much as the current detachment bills out other uh, tenants, such as a provincial RCMP officer. Thank you. Um, does this visioning uh, exercise um, can you speak about the jail facility? Because you know I have some knowledge uh, of these structures, and it's counterintuitive. Uh, kind of the the brickwork of the jail facility uh, is quite Spartan, and yet it's the most it's the most costly portion of a of a a building of this nature. Is when and and I mention it because. Uh, I can tell you that uh, as we increase in the number of officers on patrol, there is actually some studies that have been done on this that it actually increases the number of arrests that get made. So has there been some thought put into expansion or, or has it been found to be suitable for the next couple of decades, the current jail facility? I, I'm happy to kind of bring the RCMP uh, representatives okay. to answer the question in more granularity. That said, uh, the jail facility component of the existing 1999 building mm -hmm. is substantially uh, compliant for decade or decades of growth. And no, I, I mean, I don't need a lot of information on that. I'm just hoping that we're factoring that in because uh, uh, it is costly and it would be costly to remediate down the road, I think is the point, if there's an opportunity to uh, uh, to do it along the way. Um, you mentioned service provider and I'm glad that you did because uh, I can tell you there's been lots of discussions around uh, provincial landscape of policing. Um, I sit on the future policing committee for the Union of BC Municipalities and it's actually quite interesting. And there's a lot of discussion about potentially a creation reformation of the BC Provincial Police to service rural areas in, in the province and then uh, regionalizing uh, services in uh, the more dense areas of the, the lower mainland and uh, southern Vancouver Island. So correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, even if there is a change in service provider or we get told there's a regional police service that's coming, um, presumably they still need a place to work and that would be our building over there. Theoretically, is that is that accurate? Fundamentally, this is a project to expand our policing facilities. Uh, the operator, um, the municipality is, is agnostic on that. That said, uh, the city of Colwood is proud of its relationship with the RCMP okay. both from a cost effective and an efficacy perspective. And so at this juncture, we have no belief we'll be uh, moving away from that. It would be my expectation that uh, police building scaled uh, with RCMP specifications would be satisfactory for other right. occupants. Gotcha. I think my point is we might get told who our police service provider is for this region at some point by senior levels of government. So the work we're doing today presumably would service for the future, regardless of the service provider, I guess, is the actual question. And that's a yes, I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Day. Thank you. Um, difficult uh, for me, uh, because I was here, <laughs> Uh, when we built the uh, building that we're talking about replacing. Uh, and that building was built on the reasoning that we were building bigger to last longer uh, and that we would lease out space within the building. 
uh, to others in order to offset the additional costs. It never happened. It wasn't uh, acceptable. Uh, the police couldn't rent out basically the third floor of a police building really to anybody else. It, it wasn't compatible. Uh, and and uh, at that particular time, there was a major changeover in policing, uh, I guess you'd call it technology. Um, uh, and uh, eventually it was overtaken by other police uses in the building. So um, we built bigger before. Uh, we considered the lease option to recoup the cost of those additional uh, square footage. Um, we didn't see any benefit from that. And then um, the, the other problem I had in looking at the data that has come forward which really, um, you know, unfortunately, or, or maybe it's just the way it has to be, I'm not quite sure, but there's been no real sharing of information with council as these things have developed. Um, and Colwood's population in 2045, 23 years from now, um, not much different from the last time that we had to rebuild uh, the police station. Uh, uh, our population is estimated to be 34,295. Our current population is 18,961. Our estimated uh, growth rate and probably the historic rate for the last 20 years has been about in the 2, 2.5%. Uh, 2.5% uh, for 23 years until 2045 puts our population at 23,702. So much lower than what's in the report uh, for Colwood. Um, of course, that could change. Large developments could change that. That's, that's possible. Uh, that population at our current ratio would require that we had nine admin and uh, uh, office with the officers that would add up to 36 staff and officers to be in that building. Um, so I'm really um, not certain that locating our police headquarters uh, where they're currently located will result in good service for Colwood, uh, given the constraints of the road system. So it's on Veterans Memorial Parkway at Goldstream. Both Goldstream and Veterans Memorial Parkway have recently often been at a standstill. And um, I'm, I, uh, there's an additional difficulty of the assumption that we would be able to lease land for uh, the parking lot to provide two and a half acres of free parking for our RCMP. I don't think that's reasonable to expect that that, um, you know, their VHA and other places are not uh, building large car parks for their employees, neither are we. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of um, parts of this that I'm having difficulty believing that that's the best solution. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, the jail units are actually in the 1960s portion uh, of the building. They, they were um, reused and, and there were some really innovative things that were done to make that building work better until now. Um, but I just, um, I don't feel like I've been um, heard or uh, included in, in getting to this point. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's in the best interests um, to, to just um, move ahead 
Um, I, th I think that we do obviously need to accommodate our police services. We want them to be uh, respected and valued in our community, but we also want to do it in a way that we can afford. And a million dollars a year um, is what it's looking like. It, it's $20 million for something that's going to last about 20 years. Um, so I think I think a different uh, plan is needed uh, to to find what's going to work well um, for Colwood, um, and that's you know of, of course I I want it to work for Langford and View Royal. I I, I value that partnership, um, but I don't think this is the way forward for me. Oscar Jordison. Um, I feel like I have more questions than answers um, in regards to these reports. And I too feel that uh, this is a first we're kind of hearing about it or being included in this. Um, I, I realize there is a duty of care to provide to the RCMP um, and, and where they're housed in that. But who is determining um, that there's a need for a new building right now? Um, if you want to put it into perspective, we have hospitals um, in Island Health that don't uh, have their, their at capacity and they don't have room for more beds. Um, and we're constantly shuffling, uh, you know, employees to other buildings and leasing other buildings to accommodate them. Uh, we have schools that. Uh, you know, at a time in the past had duct tape and leaking ceilings, and we continue to stuff those children into those schools. So I'm wondering, I guess my concern is how bad is it? Uh, is a building necessary at this point? Um, because who says so? Um, that's my first concern. I guess um, I also, I don't understand um, how we got to the point we're at. Um, was a fair business practice model uh, followed in, in, like, how did Collier's get to be um, providing this information and doing this feasibility study? Do you know, Robert? Uh, we went to RFP and um, chose Collier's to proceed. Collier's uh, came particularly with experience in um, sizing and building RCMP facilities for municipalities. Okay. Um, I guess uh, from what I have seen already was that the building itself where it's located now, um, I, I just think the parking issue is a big concern, um, but I also feel that perhaps they're not dealing with the parking issues the way they should. And no no business built parking lots and parking garages and then lets employees park there for free. Um, so there, there's a different thinking mentality that maybe needs to happen in that regard, but also where the current building is located, it's on a water table. And I understand that underground parking cannot be um, constructed there. Um, also, Langford has approved a 12-story building in the vicinity of the police department. It's, it's like it's getting squished in there, and it's uh, not able to accommodate the growth that it needs. And so I'm, I'm really having difficulty uh, believing that that is the correct location and that other options shouldn't be further explored. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that there am my understanding from this table i guess here that i'm looking at with scenario one and scenario two that uh the land that the rcmp building on is right now if it was to go for sale it would be worth 2.7 million it, it says proceeds of proceeds of sales net of demolition sorry that's the demolition net of demolition okay and, it, and it's also stating that it would cost $9 million to purchase a new location. Sorry, which page are you referencing? Um, the, it's the table. Uh, scenario two, it's saying that it would be $9 million for land acquisition 
for in scenario two to build new. What, sorry, what page are you referencing? Oh, sorry, page uh, 24, sorry, of the Collier's report. Appendix one. In the capital cost, yeah. Appendix two. No, it has It's in. Sorry. <coughs> no, what appendix? It's not in the. It's in the original. Page two sixty. Two sixty four of three ninety six. Ah, uh, that uh, that nine million is for acquisition of what is currently. Uh, six residential properties uh, that are uh, adjacent to the facility. Okay, so they would be 5.4 and then 9 million for to build new. It's not the 9 million is under the scenario two to build new. Sorry, I, um, I'm probably not the right person to answer those questions. I'm happy to have Collier's come and speak to how they estimated the build new scenario. I, I guess I understand that it's the police uh, department's preference to stay where they are located. Um, I'm just not certain it's the most accessible and it's the best place to build um, onto it. And I just, I think that perhaps looking into this further, that building new and moving this location elsewhere may be a better solution than just upgrading one side of the building so that in 20 years we have to go and upgrade the other side of the building and it's this constant back and forth and we don't have the parking addressed and there's accessibility issues for the police department currently as well um i'm just trying to and i i, I we have no actual information as to why uh, the, this is the best location and why the Luxton location wasn't a good location or the Allendale pit or uh, the other one was Western Speedway. Like, I mean, some of them you can kind of figure out, but um, I, I just don't think that this, I, I just don't think I can support going ahead at this time with just this part of the building and and to think that that is what's best in our best interest. In regards to the funding model, um, I I don't even wanna, I mean, I, I think it took a long time to get that funding model sorted out. So until there's a better way of doing it, I um, I, I won't even go there, but I, I'm just concerned about leaving the RCMP detachment where it currently is and just putting a Band-Aid on it on, with one side of the building. Thank you. Councillor Jensen. Try the other finger. Um, th this is concerning. I mean, I can tell you that if there was concerns about the location uh, of this detachment, the detachment commander would be in here yelling and screaming up and down. And I think we're politicizing this decision and making assumptions that, uh, I mean, I don't know where they're coming from. That spot was chosen, uh, my understanding is, kind of the geographical center of all the communities in West Shore. That's why it's there. You know, and as far as uh, traffic on the VMP and Goldstream and he's not here telling us that that's a concern. It's like, we're making up these concerns. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not minimizing the concern, traffic sucks, but I can tell you that uh, Superintendent Preston would be here before us jumping up and down and yelling and screaming with his hair on fire if some of these things were an issue. Not once have I ever heard anyone say that it's a good idea to move the detachment somewhere else certainly without deep consultation with uh, those men and women who are proudly serving West Shore as we speak. So I, I, I don't know where this conversation is, is, is based in other, uh, you know, what it's based on other than, uh, uh, you know, our own Ouija board uh, magic. Uh, I mean, 
these are smart people that uh, RCMP has a whole division at headquarters that thinks these things through and comes up with these ideas and uh, does the modeling and builds the detachments. Colliers builds detachments all over the place. I would dare say they have the depth and breadth of knowledge uh, to do this job. And as far as half the building, I mean, you can't tell me that building a whole building somewhere else is going to be cheaper than building half a building on a piece of property that we already own. I, I, I don't, I don't know how to process that. It's, it's, uh, it, it really doesn't make sense to me. And as far as the parking goes, uh, I mean, my understanding is that Langford has already started acquiring some of the homes around the detachment there to service some of their parking needs. And apparently they can go underground one story. I, I missed the superintendent's most recent briefing on this stuff but uh one story they can go but they can't go any further than that and then by building as far as leasing goes uh leasing the space um there are other RC, uh, rcmp units that are paying leased costs including crest is paying lease costs to the current detachment configuration as well as uh, i think they've had uh, they have the area firearms officer that works out of the building and pays uh so there are other police units that are working up on that third floor uh, and they had to take that space back uh, to accommodate their investigations uh, uh, units. But my understanding from the superintendent is that the, by building the six stories, they are they uh, have, will lease space out and they're gonna have separate, separate entrance and egress space uh, uh, way to get up and down uh so they don't have to go into the police building proper is kind of the mentality you know or the the way it's going to be constructed and uh, that way we can recover some costings along the way uh to support this build um you know safety is at the very core of services that we provide to this community and providing a, a place for these men and women to work in presumably some modern space that isn't going to collapse in a in a earthquake uh, again my understanding is the the newer portion is it will withstand a certain amount of earth or it's built to a certain earthquake standard and the old portion is going to collapse which is why there's really nothing of significance that's working out of the old portion, old portion of the building uh, so i mean there's a lot to unpack here but Really, the ask here is for two hundred thousand dollars, sorry, three hundred thousand dollars, to explore a lot of these questions. And I think to not move forward, at least explore and find some answers to this problem, uh, you know, is short-sighted. And I, I dare say we'd be back talking about this again in a matter of months or next year with. Uh, you know, our, our feet being held to the fire. And I, I don't think putting it off a decade or two is going to help either because uh, we've watched the roundabout costs go up 30% in three months. I, I, don't, I don't know what, the, what this cost would look like in a couple of decades, but uh, those are a few of my thoughts. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't know how we can draw any comparison to, uh, uh, you know, uh, a school or a hospital, which is completely absent any responsibility of us, but this is at the very core of the services that we provide to our community. I'm sure it was just an example, Councilor Jordison, but the, the point being is, um, you know, uh, this is necessary. Um, and those are some of my thoughts. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, Councilor Jordison, I, I, I normally would give the other people the, the first time, but. I'll, I'll, if that's okay with you, or do you want to rebut? Okay. So, Councilor Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to ask about the validation process itself. Is this sort of like a, it's like a next level? So we're going to get back a report then uh, with a lot more detail on the structure, or what exactly will we see for our three hundred or our for our money? <laughs> Sorry. So the the validation process uh, pulls together. Um, all of the professionals that would be involved in delivery of the building. So uh, the all of the designers and, and the engineers and the contractors and the suppliers who would be involved in building it. And then they go through a process to truth out uh, the assumptions that are in uh, the preliminary budget. 
uh, as you can see, the preliminary budget has a plus or minus of 25% until some of that detail is, is truthed out, including supply chain is, issues. Um, there's uh, substantive uh, uh, variation in the estimate. At the end of that process, each of those uh, professionals with this procurement approach kind of um, commits, if you will, to the ownership group. Yes, we can deliver this thing uh, that you've asked for uh, with this scope for this budget. And then at that point, uh, individually and at the eventually collectively, the ownership groups makes a decision about whether or not to proceed. Uh, thank you. And one more question quick about the debt financing. And um, would that, to go public, would that be a referendum? Uh, two, two approaches. There's the kind of a counter petition process, which uh, we kind of inform the public what uh, we'd like to do if a, if a certain number of people come to the counter and sign the petition saying, no, don't do that, uh, then a referendum is required. Uh, the three communities, uh, one of the uh, options uh, that the joint steering committee will explore um, is one borrow, uh, one approval process uh, through the capital regional district, uh, rather than three approval processes and three borrows. There may be kind of uh, uh, benefits to going through that process as one, rather than each municipality doing their own. Thank you. There's a lot of uh, questions here tonight, many of which I share, but I think I would support this because I think we need to know much more and I'd like to see this move forward. Thank you. Councilor Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, Councilor Grove, you asked one of my questions around the validation process. I think that it's important to know that, you know, at the next step, there would be an opportunity to weigh in and address some of the issues that, you know, I, I have, you know, in reserve and certain some of my colleagues have expressed, but, uh, you know, there is a cost in, in moving forward, but there's also a significant cost in delay and time and again in this region, I have seen, you know, various levels of government well intentioned um, delay you know, for, for political reasons or because they, they have valid concerns only to proceed at a higher cost later on. So I'm not going to purport to be an expert on policing and police service delivery, but on the surface, it seems to me that a centralized RCMP station, if we're working in partnership with, with our sister municipalities is logical. Uh, I have to defer to the experts that it's the, you know, the logical site. Um, and if it's not, I hope that during the validation process, we would have every opportunity then to question that. And as you said, uh, Mr. Earl, we, we have that opportunity to not move forward. But to delay at this stage, I think puts us in a very difficult position. We would then have to sort of go back to the drawing board and decide, are we talking about an independent RCMP station here just in Colwood? What are the costs with that you know, on its own? Um, and are we really benefiting the Colwood taxpayer by, uh, by branching out in such a manner? So as per um, Councillor Grove, I'm, I'm inclined to support moving forward to the next stage. And you know, at that point, we'll ask some hard questions. You know, I, I don't believe a single complimentary parking spot should be provided to staff, for example. That's not something we do in the private sector. And I don't believe we should do it with public money either. It's a ridiculous notion. So I would have that conversation with, with the decision makers that we're not going to fund that. But in terms of the existing location, let's, um, you know, in, in my opinion, move to the next stage and, and weigh it on its merits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I I would like to make a motion based on the level of comfort I'm not seeing around the table that we have colliers come to present on their uh, um, on, on the proposal, and that we also ask them to present to us on why. Um, they rejected the notion of an alternate location, and um, I'm just, I'm not wanting, I'm feeling uncomfortable because I feel like I wouldn't want to name a location that I'm thinking of that, that could be functional for everyone, um, uh, but I will uh, maybe provide that offline for, for consideration of whether that's been looked at. 
uh, or not, um, and, and that uh, the the alternate location has a, a, a couple of must-haves. It has to be able to be close to a transit hub, and it has to have availability of the parking component for the police vehicles themselves. Um, and uh, that's my motion, if, if anyone. Uh, I, I just feel like with the level of discomfort that I hear around the table, my motion is not to say no to this, but to say I need more information before I say yes. Would you include uh, the uh, superintendent of the RCP2? Sure, superintendent is, he is very welcome to okay. be here. Do I have a, a, sen a seconder to that motion? Okay. Councilor Jordison, second that. Okay, discussion. Oh, I guess no, that's not an amendment. That's the first. There's discussion. <clears throat> we didn't have a first motion, right? This is the first, is motion. first motion, right? So we'll have discussion on the motion. <laughs> Councillor Jordison. Um, I just, I just feel that um, uh, that it would be remiss of me not to ask why other locations weren't decided upon because with the size of the, the facility that is needed and is going to be needed in the future it is really getting squeezed in that area that it's in currently and it there's got to be a better way and the parking is an issue that's and it's it's not really accessible and so i i think that that's my reasoning for asking about that. Um, it also, in regards to comparing it to hospital and whatnot, my point is there is um, nurses, doctors, where they work is is should be and is just as important as emergency personnel. And you know, I I believe the police have they should have a good place and a modern place to work, but this is going to fall on the cost of our taxpayers and we need to make sure that this is the right thing to do. I also understood that approving this validation process or getting to the validation process was also going to be like a, a going right to the next stage of mocking up what this building is gonna look like. And that is a waste of money if we're not sure that that should be the location. So that is my concern about that too. If it's, I don't understand in the feasibility study um, why there's not more information. And so if I could understand if we go to this next stage of the be prior to your motion, uh, Councillor Day, uh, if we went to the next stage of the original motion, which is to spend this money, are we at the stage where we're getting pretty pictures and this is what it's gonna look like on the site? Please. You're absolutely correct, Councillor uh, Jordison. The validation stage is to validate whether or not uh, a building of that scale envisioned in that way that it is can be constructed for that cost at that facility and serve the needs as described by the RCMP. It is not uh, to consider other locations and other options. Should uh, this council have pre-validation questions and have captured some of them uh, this evening and uh, uh, should uh, the existing motion pass, I will, I will uh, reach out to try to get an exhaustive list uh, for uh, should this return to chambers for uh, further information. Uh, but the validation stage is to validate uh, whether or not the building can be constructed in the way that it's described at that location, not to validate whether or not an RCMP building should be built at that location. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Oops. Council board. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Earl, question. Do you know the um, dates that uh, Langford and View Royal will be hearing this, um, this same recommendation from from their staff or 
I, I, I don't have them specifically. It was the intention that these uh, go to the various councils in the month of January. Yeah, and the reason I ask, I think, just for the, the benefit of my colleagues, is that um, if I'm going to support a motion to delay and, and have information brought forward, I want to ensure that um, that it's done so, you know, expeditiously. That you know that we have the assurance that we can hear from Colliers, and uh, and I know you can't make that assurance tonight, but that's my only concern. Again, time is money, and uh, if you know, obviously, Superintendent Preston, I think, would have a vested interest in in coming before council, but I would hope that Colliers could do the same. Um, I don't want to be um, unnecessarily delaying if you know if our if two out of three move forward. So ideally, we could do that within uh, a very short period of time and, and make it a fairly urgent matter. Councillor Jensen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to Councillor Day's motion, um, for us to get to this point. This community has already invested a bunch of money and it's gone through the RFP process and the vendor was selected and uh, hockey sack of sites were considered by the professionals who build police detachments. And I just don't feel like it's my place to believe that I know more than uh, than uh, than Collier's. Uh, about how to build these things or where to build these things. I'm, 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 is anything I said there incorrect, uh, uh, Mr. Earl? Uh, I mean, um, is that right? We've spent a bunch of money on colliers already collectively between the communities to, to get to where we're at here. Re relative to the scale and size of the global investment in this project, we have not. Uh, okay. We have spent substantive time and, and staff resources and some uh, um, uh, taxpayer resources from the three communities to advance to this stage. But relative to the size of this commitment, we have okay. not spent substantive resources. The, uh, the group has relied, relative to one of your points, the group has relied heavily on the RCMP right. and their perspective to provide us with advice on the suitability of this location mm -hmm. rather than other possible locations rather than the expertise of colliers who are more expert in the delivery of the building, not its location. So I believe that, uh, I mean, a lot of work was done by, you know, during the term of the previous council and perhaps that hasn't carried forward to this uh, current council. Uh, no one's fault other than the, the calendar, I guess, for the election, but, uh, uh, I believe, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of questions about this particular building, a lot of, we have a lot of questions about this particular location, this particular building will be answered in this next phase. And, uh, you know, I think if there was an easy answer to drop the attachment somewhere else or build somewhere else, you know, the panel of chief administrators, along with Colliers, along with the police superintendent, along with the people at RCMP division headquarters, all would have pitched that and brought that recommendation forward. And that's not what I've heard at any point along the way. It, it keeps going back to the most effective option is to rebuild in place. And uh, that's uh, my belief uh, as well as we move forward. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump in now. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, uh, totally unfair to, um, um, to to criticize or, or anything at this point in time, because I mean, even I went over to the RCMP uh, presentation when Colliers did it. And I sat there and went, where's this come? Where did this come from? Like, we weren't ever communicated to them. We were previous counsel. And to tell you the truth, this is how I feel about this. Um, and we owe this to our taxpayers because this is going to be the biggest dollar decision that we make in our term as a council. I can't think of any other one that's as big as this. And for the, for the, for the sake of, and this is why I was so excited about when they said, well, we have to have this and we have to make, we have to make these decisions now. And because we're not going to be ready for 2025, 
And of course, I got all angry about it because I thought, well, no one has told us much about this. And I know the, uh, the new counselors asked me a lot of questions and I'm going, frankly, I don't know. I, I got some education from Mr. Earl afterwards, which it helped alleviate some of my questions, but I still think they're, they're fair questions that people are asking right now. They're all fair. And, and I don't think anyone is trying to, uh, to stop it, but I think it's in all fairness to everyone here. They're owed those responses. I mean, that's what, that's what they're paid to do. So I, I believe because of the, the gravity of this, um, I think it's fair. And, and as uh, Mr. Earl has already stated, is that this next uh, validation um, stage that we're going to go through here, it's not going to answer the questions that are being asked right now. You know, if they, they're not. So I think in all fairness, um, I don't see why we just don't put a quick pause on this and try to get a, a meeting as soon as possible, because I knew this was going to happen because that was even my suggestion. I thought, well, oh boy, you, you almost want to have a separate meeting here because not all of us were there, right? Not everyone was present. And you got to understand because, you know, I, I know they looked at me and were, were saying, you know, well, what about this? And I'm going, I frankly don't know anything about this. And certain decisions were made to um, by the three um, West Shore mayors involved with it before to, um, to keep it to themselves at the time. And there was a time that they were going to announce everything, I think. Um, and so in all fairness, I mean, I was caught off guard too. So I think everything that everyone is posing around here, are, it's fair, it's fair game. And, um, and I think some of these answers are easy. Now, I did talk to uh, Superintendent Preston about this when we had a, a discussion before we went on vacation. <laughs> and I said, this is the tough one. Uh, I says, you know, because it's, uh, it's, a big, it's a big decision for us right now. And he says, okay, I, I, I totally acknowledge that. He says, I understand. And I said, you know, the first thing you may be doing is you may be coming back here and coming to council because I think there's, I says, from the feedback, the limited feedback that I have from some of the counselors right now, I think there's going to have to be another session here. Um, we sort of uh, combined it all with other councils, and some were there, some weren't there, and, and uh, we weren't really told, given the context of what it was. You know, we had a tour, and then then we had the, well, I didn't even understand the role of the Collier's people up front there, to tell you the truth. You know, it just, you had to put everything together yourself. So I just say in all fairness, uh, uh, Councillor Jensen, that um, if there is concern here that, you know, rightfully so, and, and that's all I want to say about it. I, I think that uh, I, I do support it because I can see the discomfort right now. I think everyone is reading a little bit here and, uh, and uh, $20 million, big decision. And I certainly don't want to get that wrong. So we take a little time and we have to put people up in little temporary, you know, accommodations for now. Maybe that's what we're going to have to do if we miss it by, you know, you know, it, what's another two or three week delay on this really to get it right. So that's why I'm going to support, I would support this motion. That's all I have to say. Yes. Could you repeat the motion, please? Uh, thank you, through your, your worship. Um, that Colliers be invited to present to council on their proposal for the RCMP facility and advise uh, why alternate locations were not chosen, um, and that alternate locations must be close to transit and include parking of police vehicles. Okay, I, I think it's more generic. You you want them to come here and do a presentation, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, Colliers, yeah. Which alternate locations were considered? Right. Yeah, and uh, why why they chose to go with the, the main site? Right. What the advantages? I mean, it's all way okay. okay. you know. There's going to be some good and some bad about every option. Right. And I think the last part of that is we we, yeah, we request the RCMP to be there too. Okay. Is there a time? As soon as possible. Yes. 
Speaker, can we move out something in the existing agenda to accommodate those? Sure, we can. Right, Mr. Earl? We can move anything on the agenda. Meeting. Yeah, we could have a special meeting too, right? We could have a special meeting to do this. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Okay, so that's the motion. So call the question. All those in favor? And all those opposed? We call it Jensen. Good stuff. <laughs> Okay, is that good? I'm gonna move on. Thank you very much. Uh, 8.6, we gotta get moving on here. Uh, Marcy, City of Colwood Advisory Committees, yes. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll try and make it as quick as I can. So at the inaugural meeting of council, Mayor Kobayashi advised that council will be working to establish citizen advisory committees to commence in 2023. So brought forward in the report that's proposed is the creation of the Planning and Land Use Committee, which is uh, two members of council and five citizens, parks, trails, and recreation, one member of council and six citizens, active transportation, one member of council and six citizens, and environment, which is one member of council and six citizens. Uh, the proposed meeting schedule is included within the terms of reference that are attached to the report. And also the Waterfront Coastal Processes Committee was to complete their mandate by the end of 2022. The draft Waterfront Stewardship Plan is still intended to come forward to the committee for the review and feedback, which will be presented to council. And within that re draft report, it indicates the continuance of the committee to serve as an important advisory body and partner representatives to continue to coordinate the implementation an ongoing adaption of the Colwood Waterfront Stewardship Plan. So that terms of reference is also attached to the report. In addition, council has expressed the need to have a wider perspective in the decision-making process and would like to include input from the citizens of Colwood. So they're hoping to establish some community engagement sessions that may lead to the addition of um, additional committees. So the topics for these public consultations, which are essentially like town halls, would be seniors, traffic and speeding issues, sewer, health, arts and culture, and youth. So uh, there is also some information currently that's within the report about what we had in process or in place, which was the APC. Um, but the difference between the APC is it would not include members of council. They're allowed to participate but they are not uh, voting members within that committee. That information is included within there as well. And what we were hoping to do is to have the timeline that this would go forward um, January 16th to February 3rd, that we would have advertisements out seeking volunteers for these committees. Consideration of these applications would come forward uh, February 27th. And we're hoping to have some of these committees implemented by March. Uh, in addition, I've also put forward that the third Thursday of each month at 630, excluding um, the summer months and December be held for public hearings if required. That just gives council a better understanding of when public hearings will be held and a dedicated date so the public knows as well. Uh, I believe that is it over to you thank you concert our concert day thank you um so there's just one kind of well big for me issue which is the date that you're proposing for public hearings that's iacti's regular meeting night and um iacti seems to have fallen off the map uh, so we have our service review committee uh, on the 19th scheduled, and that is their regular meeting date. So uh, both, obviously neither myself nor the alternate can attend um, uh, IACTI because of the service review. So um, 
I, I don't know how it's happened that uh, we've always been fairly careful with intermunicipal committees. It's really difficult to change the dates that they meet. Uh, so we had landed on the third Thursday because nobody else was meeting there. <laughs> now we're getting in trouble there. Uh, but um, I don't know, does it make a difference to um, planning and land use if public hearings were on the fourth Thursday? Is that an issue? Uh, through you, Your Worship, I don't see there being an issue. The, the fourth Thursday of each month would be sufficient, yes. Yeah, so could be solved with that one week, Super. one week change. Um, and just, we do have in February is the AGM will be coming up for IACTI. So uh, just to be aware of that. Um, otherwise, I uh, am supportive of the new committee structures. Uh, I think it's helpful to have a member of council on the planning and land use committee only because it takes a lot of learning to be a citizen on a committee like that. And I think it is helpful if they have some guidance from someone who, who knows what, what's happening on the other side of the recommendation. Um, and in addition to that, I was remiss to say that we also stream all of our meetings. So it does make it really difficult for volunteers to have to come in and to chair a meeting and to use the equipment and to ensure that it's being done through the proper process. So that's what we rely on council for. Thank you. Councillor Jensen, could I get a motion um, for the recommendation? Councillor Grove, seconder, Councillor Jensen, call the question, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Move on. So I'll be talking with everyone here about uh, the committee members <laughs> the next few days. I'd had that evil laugh in there. So we'll uh, get into bylaws. Uh, we'll 9.1 bylaw number 1947 land use amendment CD 28 zone area 2 Latoria South. Mover, please. Councilor Jensen, seconder. Councilor Grove, all in favor? Unanimous? No. Nope. Opposed or opposed? Uh, Councilor Day? Um, I'm going to jump nine point. Oh, oh, no, I guess I better do it in order here. I didn't say I wanted to change it. 9.2, if I can get uh, Desiree Givens to uh, present. Bylaw number 1967, land use amendment, accessory dwelling units. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> can you see my screen okay? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so the next item in your agenda is a request to amend the land use bylaw regulations for accessory dwelling units. Uh, the request is in response to an OCP policy that identified the need to review and update the bylaw to provide more flexibility to secondary suites and other suites. Um, before we get into the proposed amendments, I just have a couple slides to contextualize the request. Um, over the next decade, Colwood's population is expected to increase by over 30%. Um, and it's also important to note that the rental vacancy rate within Colwood has historically been low. A healthy vacancy rate is considered to be between 3 and 5%, whereas Colwood's rental vacancy rate is 0.5%, um, speaking to the need for more rental housing stock. Uh, revising the Regulations for ADUs could potentially support an increase in rental housing stock. Also important to note is that uh, Colwood's housing supply is predominantly single detached family homes and that the benchmark price for a single family home is over $1 million. Amending the regulations for accessory dwelling units not only provides a great opportunity to support gentle in infill <clears throat> within existing single detached neighborhoods, but it could also help support housing affordability by reducing some of the barriers that residents face in building detached ADUs. Uh, there are several policies in the OCP that support this request. Uh, the OCP supports moderate residential growth in established single detached neighborhoods and encourages sensitive infill approaches such as this one. To increase the rental stock, the OCP also supports the expansion of secondary suites, including coach houses. 
And an action item that was identified in 20, to be completed before 2023 is to review and update the land use bylaw to provide more flexibility for these types of suites. Uh, so the land use bylaw regulates uh, accessory dwelling units. And the next few slides here summarize the key regulations for two types of ADUs. So the first one is an AD, attached ADU, uh, also known as a secondary suite. An attached ADU is permitted in select agricultural and residential zones, and it can have a maximum area of 90 square meters. Uh, this is roughly 970 square feet. It is also subject to meeting the height requirements of the principal dwelling. A detached ADU is also um, is the focus of this report and is also referred to as a garden suite, a coach house, or a carriage home. A detached ADU is permitted in select agricultural, residential, and multifamily zones, and it can have a maximum area of 60 square meters, which is roughly 645 square feet. Uh, can be between one and two stories in height. Uh, in addition, since a detached ADU is located inside of an accessory building, it's also subject to these regulations on, this, on the screen. In terms of the size, the total combined floor area of all accessory buildings cannot exceed 60 square meters. Also, a detached ADU must be set back a uh, minimum distance from the front side or rear yards as shown here. To support this work, staff reviewed BC Housing's Guide on Accessory Dwelling Units, which encourages municipalities to expand the conditions under which a detached ADU can be permitted. Uh, one of the ways in which municipalities can do this is to revise their regulations to better accommodate a suite above a garage. Within Colwood, a suite above a garage is difficult to implement due to the regulation that um, caps the combined floor area of accessory buildings at 60 square meters. As explained in the staff report, when a resident wants to build a detached ADU above a garage, um, they must divide that allowable 60 square meters between the garage and the suite, which makes it challenging to constru construct anything that's larger than a micro suite above a single car garage. A few statistics to support this finding. Um, since 2019, only 2% 2 of all accessory dwelling unit applications have been in the form of a detached ADU. Also in the last five years, staff have received six variance applications uh, to help enable a detached ADU. Most often, often the applicants are requesting a relaxation to the uh, requirement that the combined floor area not exceed 60 square meters. Um, yeah, uh, to make it easier for residents to construct detached ADUs, uh, particularly ADUs above a garage, staff are recommending the following amendments to the land use bylaw. Number one is to revise the accessory dwelling unit definition uh, so that a detached ADU can be located on a duplex or a townhome lot, not just a single family home lot. Also, we are recommending that we correct the section numbering as well as section referencing to align with the section header. Um, we're recommending that we exclude the area of an ADU from the total combined floor area. This will address the barrier that a lot of, um, a lot of residents are facing in uh, constructing that accessory unit above a garage. And then lastly, we're recommending that the size for a detached ADU be increased from 60 square meters to 90 square meters to align with what's permitted for a secondary suite. A summary of the proposed changes is provided in the staff report in table three, and a copy of the draft amending bylaws provided in appendix one. So there are three options before council tonight. Option one is to give first and second reading to the amending bylaw and to schedule a public hearing before it goes to third reading. Option two is to defer the, um, the request for further information. And option three is to take no action at this time. Um, thank you so much for your time this evening. I'm available for questions if you have any. Uh, thank you very much, Desiree. Uh, Councillor Day. Thank you. Um... I'm just wondering if you could tell us, Desiree, uh, is there any protections? Uh, I wasn't able to find any any in the um, in the bylaw that would protect the open space. So these are most likely to be uh, townhouses or duplexes or single family homes in existing neighborhoods. Uh, where the outdoor uh, space is an important part of the value of our community. And um, that is why we had the limitation 
on the outdoor buildings uh, in our our bylaw before and with removing it i'm just wondering how do we protect um, that very important space for kids to play or gardens to grow thank you councillor day through the chair um so law coverage is included as a regulation in each zone of the land use bylaw so uh, typically um, single family homes are located in residential one zone or r1 and they have a maximum lot coverage of 30 percent uh, this varies obviously by zone and um, so the um, total combined area like um, if you were to combine the primary dwelling with the accessory dwelling units on a or accessory buildings on a lot would be subject to that lot meeting that lot coverage so that would be one way to regulate that so it would be limited to the lot coverage um, maximum is that, what, is that what i understand okay mm -hmm. yes exactly thank you Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jensen. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Uh, I think this is great. Uh, we should be promoting this uh, kind of gentle and fill. Uh, communities are talking about it all over the place, and there's lots of great things happening in Victoria and Saanich in this regard. And I don't think we should be inhibiting this uh, through our own bylaws. Obviously, some controls are are necessary, but I think this is a move in the right direction. Uh, and, and I'm happy to move the recommendation, uh, Your Worship, in the interest of time. Okay. I'll let you speak first, Council Ward. <laughs> Council Ward, just gotta slow things down here. Everybody's tapping their fingers. No, I, I'm also supportive. I think housing is a major issue. And uh, we talk about seniors aging in place and um, you know the ability to, you know, students and, and young people being able to stay in their community while they attend school. I think carriage houses and, and options like that, basement suites and things are the way to go. My only question, Desiree, was just on the um, inclusion of duplexes and townhomes when you've already got slightly higher density. Is that something that we've seen requests for in the past? Like it seems to me that, you know, typically from what I've seen, there isn't space available, but uh, I may not be you know, thinking of, of, I guess, legacy construction where those duplexes have the opportunity for a basement suite or something. Um, thank you, Councillor Ward, for the question and through the chair. Uh, this is not something that we've seen come up, but it was just an, another opportunity to provide more flexibility to uh, this type of suite um, that staff identified. Okay, great, thank you. So Councillor Jensen has moved the recommendation. I'm taking your second in Second, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Day is opposed. Okay, um, 9.3 bylaw 1968 building bylaw amendment, energy conservation and GHG emission reduction. Mr. Grant. Hello again. Um, yeah, so here we are tonight for the three bylaw readings. Um, and yeah, happy to field any questions that may have come up since the last time. Great. Any questions? Okay. Can I get a motion? Okay. Councillor Grove, Councillor um, Ian Ward, and I'll call the question. All those in favor? Okay. That's unanimous. There being no further business, I shall adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. And we made it in time. Yes, Mr. Oh, thank you. <laughs>